everybody to the Bali this evening. Can everybody hear me? I think so, yes. I hope you are excited uh, to be here uh, like me. Um, I'm sure there are many other things you could have done this evening. I'm always amused that this time of the year people start to talk about how Christmas is endangered. So maybe there was a cash bottle somewhere where you could also have gone to, but you didn't, you came here. So thank you for that. Um, now, while I don't think Christmas is being threatened, um, there are many other things uh, in today's society and politics um, that are worrying to me and that may also indeed be worrying to you. Um, so I'm very happy and pleased uh, that David Sheen is here this evening um, at least to decode a part of Israeli politics uh, for us. Now, I don't know how well uh, you speak and read Hebrew or how well you uh, follow all the news, but I'm sure that in uh, the 19 minutes talk uh, David will give to us this evening, there will be something new um, to hear. And don't be afraid, an hour and a half sounds like a long time, um, but David is a very engaged speaker, so I'm sure uh, you will not be bored. Um, he will cover a lot of uh, topics for us this evening. Um, he will speak about um, inner Israeli struggles like uh, poverty, uh, also the effects of climate change on Israeli politics, um, post-Trump era and how this affects Israel, also the racist attitudes in Israel towards Africans, African refugees, for instance, and also, of course, towards uh, Palestinians. Um, so I think there's a lot to learn. Uh, I won't be speaking too long, but I do want to introduce uh, David Sheen, uh, who is an independent uh, research journalist and a filmmaker born in Canada. Um, he's known for his clarifying reportings and analysis on the ground uh, from the daily events in Israel and Palestine, since he's now also an Israeli living inside of Israel. Um, and in his work, he focuses primarily on racial tensions and religious extremism, which will also become uh, clear in his talk. Um, so David, we're very happy you are here and honored. Um, so I will only say this, please do not make any recordings this evening. Uh, the whole, David's whole talk is available on YouTube, so it's not necessary to do that also. Um, and since we are a little bit limited in time, um, I ask you um, to be a modest audience, I'm sorry to ask this of you, um, but there will be a panel after David's talk uh, asking questions, and maybe if we have some time left after that, there's also a chance for you to ask question, questions, but I can't uh, guarantee you that. But in any case, when you show your ticket at the bar, you can get a drink, so that will be um, a perfect occasion also to talk about everything uh, we've heard this evening. Thank you very much. Oh, and I should, of course, uh, introduce myself a little bit. My name is Janneke Stegeman. I'm a theologian. I know that sounds surprising uh, when it comes to Israel and Palestine, because usually theologians are not uh, the go-to source uh, when it comes to this conflict. However, um, I did part of my PhD research um, on religion and conflict. So this is how I became interested, also in a sense involved, since as a Dutch Christian, um, you know, I cannot say that this conflict is, that I'm only watching from the outside. Rather, I'm in all sorts of ways um, part of this. Anyway, David, again, we're very happy you're here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. And thank you all for coming here tonight. Um, it honors me that you care enough about the place that I'm coming from to have come out here and to hear these words. So yeah, uh, like all the rest of my talks, this will be put online afterwards with the professional recording equipment and all the slides. So you'll be able to share this with friends and others and kind of analyze it slowly if there's stuff you want to think back to. I don't mind if people write stuff or take still photographs, just not audio or video. 
it's important for me that people hear the story in its entirety, not just little clips of it in poor quality, especially because of the sensitive nature of these stories I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, so I, I don't want it to be taken out of context. It's very important. And if you can, um, to stay till the end. No one's going to force you. If you have to leave, leave. But if you can stay till the end, I think it's important to give these stories their, their, their due. OK. So I'm going to speak for 90 minutes. I know it sounds like a lot. I'm going to drink a lot of water every few minutes, take a little break. So OK. <clears throat> There's a schedule for tonight. OK. Um, here we are. Israeli politics decoded. They need decoding because there's dozens of political parties. Of course, for y'all here, here in Holland, this is no big thing, right? You yourselves have lots of political parties in your parliament. Usually, I'm speaking to Americans or Canadians with two or three parties. So to them, it's overwhelming. It's daunting. Of course, even for you, if you don't speak the local language, how can you make heads or tails of what's going on here. Uh, one of the paradigms that I've come up with to try to uh, compartmentalize or to, 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 to kind of zoom in and understand what's happening is we can say that all Israeli political parties either fall under liberals, nationalists, or religious. And of course, those are the Jewish parties, the parties that represent Jewish voters. Um, but there's also parties that represent the Palestinian citizens of Israel, and they also can be divided into those categories, liberal, nationalist, and religious. If uh, you're familiar with the political parties in Israel, this is how I've broken them down, uh, so you can compare and contrast. Now, it's useful to a point, these six camps, it's a lot less than 10 or 12, but I think we can go even deeper. I think we can make it even easier for us to comprehend. And so I, uh, I downloaded in information from the government and I requested that they send me uh, uh, Microsoft Excel charts detailing voting uh, records going back to 20 years and even votes in the Knesset, actual legislative votes going back 20 years. And with these numbers, uh, I was able to crunch them and come up with this data. Again, don't, don't be intimidated. I'm going to explain what, I'm, what, what all these numbers are. What you're looking at is all the parties in the previous Knesset. And I compared every party to every other party. And I asked the question, how often do the parties vote together, vote in the same way, both yes or both no? And how often do they differ from one another? When you see green, it means they agreed. They voted the same way. Those two parties voted the same way. When it's red, they differed. Now, the pattern I noticed was that these three parties they almost always vote identically. Very, very rarely do they ever dissent. And of course, it shouldn't be so shocking. These are the three Palestinian parties. But what we see here is that even though these parties have very different ideologies, one from one, from one another, but because they are operating in a context in which ethnic politics play such a defining role in the country. So as they are my, all representing the national minority, Palestinians, even though their ideologies are different, they end up voting the same almost every time. In fact, 1,237 times compared to 23 times when sometimes even just one person voted differently. So even marginal differences, very, very, very small uh, amount of the total. OK, so if we started off with the six camps, can we break it down even further? I argue we can. We can put all the three Palestinian parties into a single camp and each of the Jewish uh, camps into one. So, we're left with segregation, domination, elimination. One. Now we've got four camps, or four sides, as I would say. These are the four political camps in Israel, not Jews and Arabs or Israelis and Palestinians. No, I say there's four sides. And these are the sides. It's easy to remember them also because they spell out the word side. So you'll remember even after you leave the, the hall. And they are segregation, integration, domination, elimination. So segregation two-state solution, Jews in one state, Palestinians in another state. OK, next, the integration. One state in which everyone has equal rights. One democratic state, that's integration. Domination, again, one state from the river to the sea on all the land of mandatory Palestine. But in that state, it's an apartheid state. Jews have more rights. Palestinians, other non-Jewish citizens, have less rights, fewer rights, smaller subset of rights. And elimination. 
also one state, but they want that state to be ethnically cleansed of Palestinians. So these are the four camps. Now, you know, I came up with this, but in fact, one year ago, Tel Aviv University conducted a study and they asked participants, Israeli Jews, essentially the same set of questions. They said, how many states and what kind of states do you support? And they gave them the same four options of two, one, of side, of S-I-D-E. And what they found was this. So, I know you haven't burned into your mind the, the four camp schema or the four side system, but what you can easily see is that the camp that has the most amount of popular support amongst Israeli Jews is segregation, the two-state solution. It would seem on the face of this that the plurality, the largest amount of Israeli Jews support two-state solution, or as they described it in the poll, specifically to establish a Palestinian state alongside Israel. Okay. The problem here is that it doesn't stand probing. So, for example, when you ask Israeli Jews, because any two-state solution is going to involve some kind of, uh, th there are details, there are specific details. Where will the border be? What will happen to settlements? What about Jerusalem? What about Palestinian refugees? All these things are issues that have been negotiated for decades now and no one's ever come to a conclusion about them. So when you ask Israelis about the specific details of any Palestinian state, you see that as you ask more and more questions, fewer and fewer and fewer Israeli Jews end up agreeing and supporting the two-state solution. So when you get to the end of it, less than 20%, in fact, still support that two-state solution with all the caveats of what it must include, meaning that three-quarters of Israeli Jews actually oppose those conditions that are required to create a two-state solution. Three-quarters. Now, think of it this way. This isn't like some maximal Palestinian goal that, oh, well, of course Israeli Jews are going to disagree. I mean, they're demanding too much. These are the minimal demands that any Palestinian leader could expect to, to agree to. I mean, we're talking about even under a two-state solution, Israel controlling 75 plus, over three quarters of the territory of the land. Even if you count all the West Bank and that little tiny sliver, that's Gaza there, put them together, that's still not even a quarter of the landmass. So these conditions are the minimum that anyone who leads Palestinian people can expect to stand by, and that agreement is opposed by three quarters of Israeli Jews. So we're at an impasse. Okay. Now, about that two-state solution, many would argue that, in fact, it's impossible because in the intervening years, all these years that we've been waiting for the Oslo peace process to come together for naught, what's been happening on the ground? The Israeli government has been continuing to colonize the West Bank and increase the size of the settlements and expand them and legalize outposts to the point where the West Bank is just Swiss cheese and many people argue that it's impossible at this point to create a separate Palestinian state that's, that's actually autonomous. So those same Tel Aviv University researchers then asked the same Israeli Jews, okay, let's say the two-state solution's off the table. It's impossible. What then? There's only one state that remains. Do you want that one state to be democratic and everyone in it to have equal rights? Or do you want that one state to be apartheid or worse or ethnically cleansed? And I'm sad to say that only a quarter of Israeli Jews then said, we want that state to be democratic. And two-thirds of Israeli Jews said they want that one state to be either apartheid or ethnically cleansed, even worse. So these uh, results are, are quite devastating, I'd, I'd argue. Um, again, that's if we ask Israeli Jews how many states they want. But we can also frame the question differently, right? Instead of asking them about states in which they tend to over-report their support for democracy and under-report their support for the alternate solutions that are not democratic, we ask them instead not how many states you want, but rather what do you want your relationship to be vis-a-vis -vis the non-Jewish population of the country? How do you want Palestinian people to be treated? And in fact, a Pew poll was conducted just a couple years ago on Israeli Jews, and they found that when they asked them, do you agree or strongly agree that Jews deserve preferential treatment in Israel to be citizens plus? In fact, 78% of Israeli Jews agreed 
or strongly agreed with that statement. So that's support for the domination camp. And when asked, do you agree with the statement that Arabs should be expelled or transferred from Israel? Full 48% of Israeli Jews, nearly half, agreed with the eliminationist credo. So, I mean, this is, this is horrific. These numbers are horrific. Um, when we break it down according to my four-side formula, and we put each of those political parties in the camp that it belongs to, in my analysis, and then we look at the results of Israeli elections, that we find that these are the results. The Israeli election results almost mirror the Pew poll results in that the largest camp by far in Israel, the most popular camp, is the domination, the one apartheid state camp. And that the second most popular political camp in Israel is the eliminationist, the ethnically cleansed uh, state camp. So depressing to say the least. Okay, now those who have some sense of the Israeli political system might put me on pause at this point. They'll say, okay, David, interesting theory. I'll give you that much, but something doesn't sit right with me. Why is it that you've put a Machane Tzioni in the domination camp? Why would you say that the Labour Party, Israel's Labour Party, is in the apartheid camp. They don't claim to support apartheid. If you, ask, if you look at their, uh, you know, their internal documents published online, they'll say, no, we support a two-state solution. Fair enough. Legitimate criticism. That is true. They don't say they want apartheid, but all right. It's easier for us to understand Netanyahu as an apartheid supporter. He's constantly giving us material to use. Every other day, he's got a new quote. Uh, and the 50-year anniversary of the conquering of the West Bank, of Israel's conquering of the West Bank, he said at an event there, we are here to stay forever. There will be no more uprooting of settlements in the land of Israel. Okay. No shocker there. No shocker when just a couple months ago, the ruling Likud party, Netanyahu's party, votes unanimously, in, quote, to allow free construction and apply the laws of Israel to all liberated areas in Judea and Samaria. That's the West Bank. So, okay, no shocker that Netanyahu and his political party support apartheid. But what about cute David Ben-Gurion, so cute? How could you possibly call him an apartheid supporter? Is that fair to say this of the Labour Party? Well, it was the Labour Party in power that drove out hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in the 1948 war in which Israel was established. It was the Labour Party in power that conquered the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, Sinai, the Golan Heights in 1967, the Six Day War. It was the Labour Party who was in power when the settlement movement began in earnest. It was Shimon Peres, the peacenik, who supported the settlements. It was Yitzhak Rabin, who was the defense minister who crushed the bones of Palestinians in the first Intifada uprising. And okay, admittedly, it was also the Labour Party who were in power when the Oslo peace process was initiated. Fair enough, I'll give you that. But the man who did so, Yossi Belin, was a deputy minister working outside the system. Rabin knew nothing about it. Paris knew nothing about it. It was a separate channel that unbeknownst to them, he was quietly negotiating a deal with Palestinians in Oslo. And as such, once it was presented to the labor leaders as a fait accompli, they said, OK, but it didn't originate from them. And in fact, just a decade later, in 2003, Yossi Balin had realized that the Labour Party had no interest in actually implementing this policy. And so he left the Labour Party and joined as the leader of the Meretz Party. And that's the only Israeli party, that, the actual Zionist left, that, that does actually support a two-state solution. So if there's any doubt of what I'm talking about, we can look to the present government. This is the current sitting government elected in 2015. Netanyahu is surrounded by his ministers. And in that government, you see on the right, is Avi Gabay. Okay, he was a minister in Netanyahu's government when the government was sworn in. Today, he's supposedly the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Labour Party who's going to oust Netanyahu. You know, the great white hope, please. Things he said over the, just in the last couple of years about settlements, they are the beautiful and devoted face of Zionism. 
if a peace deal is made, why do we need to evacuate? And he says about the Palestinian parties in the Knesset, we will not share a government with a joint list, period. Okay. So, he's not even willing to sit with Arab people in a government coalition. And this is the reason why Israel's political system always reaches for the right. So, th this is how um, the Israeli political system breaks down. It, the very, very, very bottom of the slide is cut off, so you, you won't see the level of detail. But I, my point is that these are the proportions of each of the political camps. So as you can see, the integration camp, the Palestinian parties on the left, the yellow strip there, okay? Now Gabai is saying, I'm not going to work with you under any circumstance. So I won't sit with you in a coalition. We have to cut them off. They're not considered legitimate in his playbook. So where else can he get those votes from? He needs 50% to control the government, okay? But if he's not going to get them from the left, he's got to reach for the right. So every time out, this is what happens, especially around election time, this is when the racism ramps up, when like even Labour Party leaders start making all kinds of racist statements in order to reach for those right-wing votes. The problem is, if you're a right-wing voter, why would you want the, you know, the upstart, you know, sometimes wishy-washy, most of the time, you know, likes to have a, a, a public face of supporting two states, but when it comes down to election time, then you pander to the right. You just want the authentic, the real deal, the, the, the party that, you know, advocates apartheid all year round. So no one's really fooled by this, and that's why they never even have an opportunity to come to power, and certainly not on, with a mandate for peace. And this is why Netanyahu, it's so easy for him to create that coalition government using the, the right flank of the, of the uh, dominationist camp together with the eliminationist camp. With those two camps, he creates the government time and time again. And this is what the Israeli parliament looks like as a result. So as you see on the left, the integration parties, that little sliver, that aqua-colored two-state solution, Meretz, and then the broad swath of blue in the center from the government and from the opposition, but two wings of the same domination camp and then the elimination on the far right. So this is what it looks like. Um, it's even more obvious when we look at it on a municipal level and we see how many cities uh, had majority votes to one of these political camps. We see it's, it's even more obvious. Geographically, we can see how it breaks down, uh, but without going into too fine a resolution, here are, in my opinion, the slides that break it down best. So these are all Israeli elections for parliament held since 2000. And I'll, in the next coming months, we will probably see another election. But uh, in the meantime, these are all those elections. And you notice, as I mentioned, that there, is so, there are so many political parties and it's difficult to make heads or tails of what's going on here, who's going, whose political fortunes are rising and falling or what's going to happen next. It seems like a big mess, a big balagan, as we say. But when instead of charting the political party's results in the elections, we instead chart according to political camp, we find that instead of being a crazy mess, it's very stable all of a sudden. And we see that consistently for the last two decades, at least, the Israeli electorate chooses time and time again to be led by the domination camp and that the second most powerful camp is the elimination camp. The democratic camps, segregation, integration, lag far behind. So very worrying state of affairs to say the very least. Okay, time for a quick water break. Incidentally, I should mention that on my website, davidsheen.com, you can find links to this actual data. You can see these charted, and they're interactive charts, and they're linked to the original data. So if you find it hard to believe, you're welcome to reproduce these experiments uh, using visual data visualization tools on the internet. And I encourage you to do so if you find this hard to believe. It's difficult to face, but these are the facts. Now, 
what does it look like in practice to live in a country in which the domination and elimination camps are the strongest, and those in power? Well, a couple years ago, the Israeli artist Asaf Chanuka, he illustrated this political cartoon, and what he was saying here, if it's not obvious, is that militarism is so encoded into the Israeli psyche that it's as if it's imprinted on babies when they're still in their mother's tummies, that even fetuses are militarized. Of course, he's joking. He's trying to be satirical. The problem is that this isn't satire anymore. This year, just a few months ago, an Israeli hospital actually produced this advertisement in which they appealed to people, said, well, we want you to give birth in our hospital. If you give birth to your babies in our hospital, there's a greater chance that those babies will turn out to be military heroes. So it's like satire is impossible. Reality has eclipsed it. This is where, this is where we're at. This is how far gone we are. Of course, this is just a an illustration, but it's borne out by what's happening on the ground. So in recent years, we see um, you know, Israeli police actually embarking on a new program to instill militarism in grade school youth, bringing police officers and police weapons to, to grade schoolers and letting them you know, try them on for size and even taking, you know, doing demonstrations where they pretend to sh do a shootout and sh uh, shoot down a terrorist and yay, the police shot dead the terrorist and, and, and then even sometimes taking students to firing ranges to shoot at pictures of Arabs in kafia and in, in, in scarves. Now, okay. It's not only David Sheen talking about this stuff. Let's just put this in their proper perspective. This is uh, Yosef Shapira, who is Israel's comptroller. I don't know if you have a comptroller here. In the Netherlands, it's someone who's, uh, it's an apolitical position, uh, an official whose job it is just to ensure that the government uh, is accountable and does what it says it's going to do, and et cetera. So he uh, issued a report two years ago, and it was a report on Israel's education system. How are Israeli youth being educated? And what he found there, he wrote, I will not gloss over the state of affairs. It shows a grim picture. The state of Israel is doing very little to purge the severe phenomena of racism and hatred among youth. Worse than this, he says, over the years, the Ministry of Education has avoided taking the necessary steps for the prevention of racism. So not only is it not doing anything, it's actively, it's purposefully not doing anything. Why would it not doing anything? Why would it? Well, in the last decade, Netanyahu has been prime minister the entire time, but Israel has cycled through a series of education ministers, but all of those education ministers have been Orthodox Jews, and that hasn't been accidental. It's been purposeful, very much so, and now we're going to go into a section of the talk that is the most sensitive part, as I alluded to earlier. So what does it mean for Israeli Jews to, to study in a system, in an education system, in which um, Orthodox Jewry, state-sponsored Orthodox Jewry, is infused into the curriculum? So you get to school, day one, and school gives out these agenda books. Do you have them here in the Netherlands as well, where you know you can write your schedule for the week, for the month, and what homework assignments you have? So kids get to school, they get this agenda book, and included in the agenda book is this cartoon. Again, I don't expect you to read Hebrew. I'll break it down in English. So this is the cartoon. Brother and his sister talking. Hey, Uzi, let's play war. All right, I'll bring my soldier costume from Purim. Purim is a Jewish holiday. It's like a Bacchanalian festival. And it's like a Hebrew Halloween kind of everyone. Kids love to dress up. So he gets his soldier costume. 15 minutes later, at the end of the war. Hey, Jewish soldier. OK, so you defeated us and took me captive. But if you marry me, I'll ma if you free me, I'll marry you. You ought to. I'm really pretty. What is this? This is some weird. I mean, marry a Gentile? A daughter of the enemy? Never. No chance. No way. Wait, 
Actually, I once learned that there is a law called pretty woman. What is he talking about here? This is an actual thing. Okay, all you know, medieval religions have their weird wonky rules, but th this is an actual thing and it's not just past tense, it's very much present tense. Because this rabbi, Eyal Krim, when he was asked, uh, it's common for you know, Orthodox Jews to like, pose questions to leading rabbis saying, you know, what should I do under this circumstance? What's the law that I should follow? And so when he was asked, straight up, quote, is it allowed for an IDF soldier to rape girls? I mean, that, that's what it would seem from this law in the Talmud, this pretty woman law. Is, is this in fact true? He responds, the Torah permitted the individual to satisfy the evil urge. So yes, Jewish soldiers may rape non-Jewish women during wartime. Now, after he made this statement, he was made chief rabbi of the Israeli army of Jewish soldiers. Worrying isn't even the word. And again, it's not just one, it's not just some, you know, one rabbi in the middle of nowhere that no one knows about. No, 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 no. Shmuel Eliyahu has been the chief rabbi of the holy city of Tzfat for 30 years. He makes a big fat paycheck from my tax money. And what does he do with it when you know, people come to him for his sagely wisdom? And he's asked, oh, I should also point out, you know how it goes. He's the chief rabbi, the son of a chief rabbi as well. And so when Shmuel Eliyahu is asked, if the regime in Israel was a Jewish theocracy, would a pretty woman be permitted nowadays as well? You know, if we succeed in creating this Torah state where there's no separation between state and synagogue, then would we also still be allowed to rape non-Jewish women in wartime? Where is the respect for women? So women are war booty? That kind of life is worse than dying at war. The person who wrote this is obviously perturbed by what he's read in the, in the texts, and he wants to clarify it. Is this, can this be? I mean, allowing a, a Jewish soldier to rape a woman, and it's unconscionable in our day and time. And so Shmuel Eliyahu didn't see it that way. He responded saying, now he has got to fight the Jewish soldier, and you shouldn't be preaching morality to him. Don't weaken his spirit. Far from his wife, cravings burn in him. During war, he's liable to think about women and then not fight as well. If you forbid him from a beautiful woman, it's likely to get to the point where the Jewish people will be defeated. If he can't rape willy-nilly, he's not going to fight as well. In that case, the Torah said, if it burns in you, take a pretty woman. Wow. This is an indictment, if anything. And... Again, he continues, he goes to say, well, I mean, that, that's all good and theoretical. That is the law. But really, who's putting it into practice? Today, Jewish men have no desire for Arab women. Uh, OK, sure, man. Uh, putting aside the fact that 50% of Israeli Jewish women are Arab Jewish women, as 50% plus of the Israeli population are Jews from Middle Eastern countries. so. I mean, off the top, let's just say that's absolutely ridiculous. But even if we just look to Pornhub and see the kinds of statistics that Mia Khalifa gets on her, uh, you know, porno downloads, we can see that Israelis, no less than anyone else in the world, loves to watch uh, beautiful Arab women as well and find them sexually attractive. So I think, but of course, according to this rabbi, esteemed rabbi, he goes on to explain, if you find one, it's one in a million, any, you know, any Jew, man, any Jewish man that would be attracted to an Arab woman, oh my God, only one in a million. If you check that one in a million, you also understand why. Okay, well, I'm not asking your advice, but it's very instructive that these are the kinds of messages that come from our state-sponsored religious officials. This man was picked by the elimination camp education minister, Naftali Bennett, he was preferred pick for chief rabbi of all of Israel. And in fact, when he goes places, he's, he's worshipped. People kiss his hand, he enters a room, everyone stands at attention. This is the kinds of respect and adulation that he receives in Israel. This photograph in which he was receiving a standing ovation is just from a couple months ago at an official government education conference, government conference on education. And at that conference, um, 
they gave a Lifetime Achievement Award. Now, who would the Israeli government decide to give a Lifetime Achievement Award for, to, rather? And it was this man, Moshe Zahr. He got up to receive his award, and he gave a little speech, and this is what he said. I am known for saying, build a house, it's like you wiped out a hundred Arabs. Build a settlement, it's like you wiped out tens of thousands of Gentiles. That's the truth. And the crowd bursts into applause. And Naftali Bennett's sitting right there in the, in the audience. He doesn't stand up and, oh, 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 wait a second, what are you talking about? That's, that's, that's ray, crazy racist, that's disgusting. No. The applause continues. And so why would we put this person on a stage and give him a Lifetime Achievement Award? Would, were you surprised? Did this take you by surprise? Were you taken aback that this man would all of a sudden you know, just casually call for genocide? Well, you shouldn't have been so shocked. It couldn't have caught you by surprise. This is a guy who 30 years ago, he was the head of a terrorist group that tried to assassinate, tried to bomb three Palestinian mayors. The mayor of Ramallah, the mayor of Nablus, and the mayor of Albire. They set off bombs in their cars, and this is the, the mayor of Nablus at that time. They, they took his legs off. Okay, this is, a contempor this is a photo from that time. He never sat in jail for that. He, he was in, you know, awaiting trial four months in jail, but came time for sentencing. He didn't, wasn't sentenced to any jail time. Okay, this is Israeli justice. This is how we rehabilitate our terrorists. The driver of those Jewish terrorists, Chagai Sega, today, he's the editor of a newspaper in Israel. Okay, a newspaper, mind you, that made Elor Azaria, the Hebron shooter, man of the year, a couple years ago, if you can imagine that. And uh, it wasn't only them, also another of the Jewish underground, so-called Jewish terrorists of the early 80s, uh, Yehuda Tzion, uh, another settler who here is photographed with Shimon Peres, of all people, planting a tree in a settlement of Fois. But Yehuda Tzion, in the 1980s, he plotted to actually blow up the Dome of the Rock. All right, so his plan, he actually amassed explosives and got architectural plans and plotted it out. And the idea was that he was, go it was stopped in time. Israeli forces managed to catch him in time. But his idea was to explode the Dome of the Rock. Now, obviously, this has a, you know, great meaning for the Muslim world. This is considered the third most important shrine in Muslimdom. But it's also a very potent symbol of Palestinian nationalism, even for non-Muslim Palestinians, because it's like the last little piece of Palestine in which Palestinians have some measure of autonomy there. In any case, it's also the most beautiful piece of architecture in the whole country, and he wants to explode it, or did at that time. Now he, he, he has a different view of it. I mean, he's still, he, he did serve in jail for about five years. That was back in the day. Now he's out, and now he's back on the mount next to the Dome of the Rock. Once again, what's he doing there now? Well, he realizes that you know, he's in the limelight a bit much, so he can't himself carry out those explosive um, plans. But, but what he does is he hopes to convince enough Israeli Jews to, to demand that the government do so. And so he's one of the leaders of the Templar movement. He, uh, pictured here, gets sheep. And his idea is he doesn't want Jewish people to pray to God anymore. He doesn't want them to you know, supplicate to Yahweh, to Jehovah, and offer their prayers up. He wants them instead to revert, to turn time back 2,000 years. He wants Jews instead to sacrifice animals to Yahweh. These are photographs that I and my colleague Dan Cohen took. Um, so this is Yehuda Etzion being helped by an Israeli police officer hold down this, and, and they conduct these rituals now every year on Passover. And the idea is that they'll be the vanguard, they'll be the first to do so, but they are demanding that this become the national religious expression. And not only that they sacrifice animals instead of praying to God, but that they do so on the Temple Mount, on the Haram al-Sharif. So the idea is where that Dome of the Rock is now, that's where they would build a Jewish temple slash abattoir 
where they would not just slaughter one or two animals, but 10,000 or more in a day on a Jewish holiday, to the point where in the scriptures it says, praised be the priests in the temples who were up to their knees in blood. There's actually grooves in the ground still in Haram al-Sharif where you can see where the blood drained. This is how you know, Israelite people worshipped Yahweh 2,000 years ago. They want to go back to it. They, don't, they want people not to pray but to have an intermediary to go to God for you know, Jewish people to give offerings through the priests and for the priests to conduct these sacrifices and only if you belong to the proper bloodline can you be one of these chosen priests. This is their vision. Now, again, this isn't just a fantasy of what happened uh, 2,000 years ago. They're actually doing this. They're actually conducting these rituals with all the garments and, and instruments. And now they're even doing it right outside Al-Aqsa itself. That's how close they're getting. And um, their goal, of course, is not to do it close to Al-Aqsa, but to do it on Al-Aqsa for, for the Dome of the Rock to be just demolished and for this temple to be built on its ruins. That's the plan. And this is Israel Ariel. This is the chief rabbi of the Templar movement. Now, who is this man, Israel Ariel, that uh, is the chief rabbi of the Templar movement? Now, 30 years ago, oh, first of all, I should just point out that he has literally called not only to ethnically cleanse Israel, but the entire Middle East. If you can imagine, he wants wars of conquering, expansion. He says, and again, this is all online. I recorded it, uploaded it. It's there for anyone to hear. Unfortunately, me and my partner, Dan Cohen, were the only journalists who cared to listen. But these are public events. I'm not sitting behind a computer saying what I think because I read it somewhere. I'm going there down to the events itself and recording these people saying these things. Okay, so make no mistake about it. He says, we record him saying, we will conquer Iraq, Turkey. We will get to Iran too. The mosques and the Christian spires and their crosses come down in every place we conquer. And if not, you kill all of their males by sword. You leave only the women. So this is his vision for not just greater Israel, but grander Israel for, you know, total, domi total domination of the region. Now, it's very obvious that these views are extremist, okay? And in fact, 30 years ago, they were considered extremist, even by Israeli standards. This man, Israel Ariel, 30 years ago, he ran for parliament. He was actually number two on which party's list? The list of Mayor Kahana. Okay, a political party that was ruled illegal by the Israeli parliament because even they were dis even all the other parties were disgusted by its racism. It was so blatantly racist that the government put, you know, said, you are beyond the pale. You're too racist for our political system. And they, they made them illegal. Um, but, you know, if 30 years ago he was too racist for the parliament, today he's just right. Okay, another photograph I took of, is, uh, you know, being given a standing ovation in the Israeli parliament, in the Knesset. And this man is now considered, you know, uh, someone who's, you know, someone to revere. He even received uh, the war, the Pras Yerushalayim, the Jerusalem Prize from the mayor of Jerusalem, Mir Barkat. So this is how far the Israeli political system has shifted in recent decades, from too far gone to just right, just racist enough for our taste. Now... At this point, I can only imagine that some of you may be very shocked and very disturbed. I've also not only been talking about militarism, but I've been talking about religious extremism. And some of you may start to wonder, well, are you suggesting, David, that this is Judaism, that Judaism is racist? Are you saying that that's what's in the Bible, that the Torah is racist? Okay. Um, let's, let's have a closer look then. Let's talk about the Bible itself and what's in there and what isn't in there and what we can glean from it. Another quick drink of water. Okay.
first of all, this isn't written by God. So in any case, it does, we're not perceiving the thoughts and feelings of God by reading these words. They're written by people. They're written by various different people in different periods of time, each of them with their own set of interests. But, you know, the British people have Shakespeare and Jewish people have the Torah. These are, uh, these, this is our literature, you know, this is our literary heritage. And I believe we should treat it as such, not as an instruction manual and definitely not as a history book, which it's very far from. So we're not looking at these incidences as actual uh, uh, literal stories, but we read them for what they are, which is uh, what is the kernel of the narrative in the Torah, in the Bible? And I'm sure, you know, people growing up here, you mentioned the Dutch church tradition, so I'm sure some of you know these stories, but very, very briefly for those from a completely secular background. Um, the, the kernel story, the nugget in there, is that the Hebrew people were, according to these legends, were slaves in the land of Egypt for the Egyptian pharaoh. And they labored for him. And then one day, the leader of the Hebrew people, Moses, and his brother Aaron, they came to the Pharaoh and they demanded, let my people go, allow us to be free. And Pharaoh refused, but then Yahweh, or Jehovah, said, okay, well, if you refuse, then I'm going to punish you and I'm going to send plagues upon you. And so he sent the plague of blood and the plague of frogs and all the other plagues. And finally, eventually, Pharaoh broke down and said, okay, 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 fine. All right, I'll allow you to go, go, get out of here, leave. And so the Hebrew people, the Israelites, left Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea. And then they wandered through the desert. And in the desert, Yahweh provided them with food, provided them with water, and then brought them to a mountain in the desert, Mount Sinai. And as they assembled there, Moses went up top. And supposedly, according to the narrative, he communed with Yahweh, with God. God gave him the laws, his laws, in the form of these two tablets. And then upon receiving these laws of God, supposedly, Moses then walked down the mountain and saw this sight. He was outraged to see, according to the text, that the Hebrew people were worshiping a golden calf. So far, we're on the same page. People have heard this story before. Okay. Now, that's the legend. Now, let's get back to the actual facts. Okay, there is no evidence of Hebrew people ever worshiping a golden calf, but there is lots of evidence of Hebrew people worshiping all kinds of gods and goddesses in the Near East. Um, there's actual physical evidence of this. You'd only have to dig down a little bit in Jerusalem to find clay figurines that people had in their own homes. Um, not just these kinds of uh, fetish objects, but also there were there were remains of temples to all kinds of gods and goddesses in the Jerusalem area. Um, because at that time, the Hebrew people were not monotheists. They were monolatrists, uh, meaning that like other peoples in the Levant, they had their own national god. So this, he's our god, but... There was no conflict between having your own national god and also worshipping other gods and go acknowledging and occasionally worshipping other gods and goddesses. And there was also no conflict in other peoples who had their own national gods sometimes coming to worship at your temple and worship your national god. That was not seen as any kind of contradiction back in the day for the vast majority of Israelites. Now, then came along the eliminationist camp of the Jewish people. Because if monolatrism is the integration credo of the Jewish religion, monon monotheism is the elimination credo. And so the monotheists came, and they demanded an end to the integration. And they purged Jewish practice of the integration camp. And what did that look like? It looked like stamping out the worship, you know, driving out the worship of any other gods and goddesses. But it also looked like demanding racial purity. And since there was no objection before to interracial relationships or interethnic relationships between Hebrews and non-Hebrews, at that point, the eliminationists demanded and forced mixed couples to divorce. 
They would not stand for interracial relationships anymore. And those monothe monotheists, rather, those eliminationist Jews were the ones that edited the Torah and who wrote the Talmud and decided what would be the Judaism that we would be left with, the fragments that we would be handed down in this day and age with the integrationists ejected from the camp. So what are we left with? We're left with temple worship, which is what they encoded. We're left with bloody rituals, whether it's our own infant babies, whether it's animal slaughter, as I discussed earlier, or whether it's slaughtering other people in the Bible. I mean, these stories aren't, again, not meant to be believed as actual fact, but those stories are there. And they talk about little mini genocides left and right, whether it's enemies of the Jewish people or sometimes even groups of Jews, 3,000 Jews supposedly rebellious against the leadership whose God sanctions them murdering their men, women, and children. Other Jews in the Bible. Read your Bible. It's crazy. So this is the religion we're left with, um, one that is zealous and jealous and does not allow anything other than eliminationism. Um, now, this is the Talmud, also called the Jewish New Testament by some, and it did you know, alter some of these texts. Because like every religion, Judaism has its golden rule. Of course, there's not just ugly things in the Torah. There's also beautiful things in the Torah, words of wisdom that you know, we, do pass, we would want to pass on to our children, like love thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's basic stuff. Every major religion has this, thankfully. And this is, you know, sure enough, you open up the book of Leviticus and it's right there. But by the time we get to the Talmud, those who edited the Torah and interpreted the Torah and explained to us what the Torah really means, then they changed the rules. And they put an asterisk in there and they say, oh yeah, you know how it says neighbor? Well, it really means fellow religious Jewish man. That's who you're supposed to love as yourself. Non-Jews, non-religious, they don't deserve your love. And yeah, I remember that part of the Torah where it says, one law shall be both for you and for the stranger who lives with you. I hear this about it a lot nowadays in regards to the refugee issue, uh, that there should be no citizens plus and citizens minus, that everyone who lives in the land should be equal under the law, basic stuff we think of as democratic, no. Well, yeah, you know what it says that in the Torah? Well, nah, it, we need to have an asterisk there because stranger really means convert to Orthodox Judaism. So you only need to have one set of rules for blood Jews or born Jews and ch Jews of choice or Jews who converted to Judaism. But non-Jews do not have to you know, follow, or do not fall under the same legal protections. You can have different laws discriminating against them. So yeah, it gets worse. And, and please, uh, this is not only the case with Judaism. We can talk about all the other monotheistic religions at the very least. Uh, Christianity, Islam, you don't get off the hook by any means. I'm sure that we can bring someone else up here who can say the same kinds of stories about those other traditions. But we're not here to talk about those other traditions. We're talking about the Jewish state. And so today, how do we determine what is Jewish law? What do Orthodox Jews say is the determiner of Jewish law? It is this man uh, who was until a few years ago on the Israeli one shekel bill. We no longer have one shekel bills. But when we once did, this man was on his visage was on the one shekel bill, and this is Moses ben Maimon, or Maimonides, who lived in medieval times, medieval rabbi. And he was so revered, he is so revered that there's a famous saying about him, saying from Moses of the Bible to Moses Maimonides, there were none greater than Moses Maimonides, meaning, you know, uh, Orthodox rabbis try to reach back as far back in time to find like the most authorita authoritative voice in the canon. And they say that after Moses, the next greatest rabbi after the lawgiver was the exegesis Maimonides. So he is the person who decides what is Jewish law and what isn't Jewish law. And what does Maimonides say about non-Jews? How should they be treated according to Orthodox Judaism? He says, 
Do not follow the ways of the non-Jews and do not be similar to them in clothes or hair. Segregate yourself from them. Not only that, he says, anyone who does one of these things is whipped. So corporal punishment, if you follow the same customs as non-Jewish people, if you don't separate yourself. He then goes on to say how they will dominate non-Jews. Taxes they get will be that they will be sent to work with their bodies, fortifying the king's palace. Not only that, we'll also humiliate them. The labor they get will be that they will be despised and humbled low, and they won't raise their heads among Jews. They should be ashamed of themselves walking amongst Jewish people. Now that's you know, where we have some measure of control, but what about when we really get into our power? When the Jews are mightier than non-Jews, we are forbidden to permit them among us, even interim residents. When you are strong enough, when the Jews are strong enough, we don't even allow them to be second-class citizens in our country. We ethnically cleanse them. That's the law. Now, again, it's not only Maimonides who says so in medieval times. This is Israel's chief rabbi today, the rabbi of all Israel, Yitzchak Yosef. Again, no shocker here. I know you're, gonna, you're hardly going to be surprised when I show you that he, too, is a chief rabbi, son of a chief rabbi. But now he is the current chief rabbi. And he said a couple years ago, according to Jewish law, it is forbidden for Gentiles to live in the land of Israel. Straight up. Again, I actually believe in free speech, even for the most racist people. I think that he has every right to express his views. I just don't think he has any right to do so when I'm paying his salary. But he says so, and he's still in power. And and he goes on to explain what he means. He says, if our hands were strong, if we had governing power, then Gentiles should not live in the land of Israel. If we were strong enough, we'd kick them all out. But we're not strong. Our hands are not strong. We are waiting for a righteous Messiah. And then they will do this. Then they will kick out all the non-Jews. Okay, that's worrisome. So... If all they're waiting for to commit this ethnic cleansing is for their Messiah to come, then when does the Messiah come? What are the rules that determine whether we are living in the Messianic era that then give us license to ethnically cleanse non-Jews? And it's, it's different than what you'd think. I mean, you'd think, oh, the Messiah, it's some incredible spiritual connection, someone who's floating on the air and has magic powers. And I mean, in some other traditions, that may be the case. But again, we're talking about the Jewish tradition. And according to Maimonides, it's actually nothing like this at all. It's very, very simple. Maimonides says that the only difference between today, or his time when he was talking, and the Messianic age is only two things, only two requirements needed. They are two. One, returning to the land. The Jews must begin to leave the rest of the world and to congregate in Israel. That's surely been the case for the last century. We've now passed the point where Jewish, there's more Jewish people in Israel than in any other country in the world. So that much, that condition has been satisfied, check. And the second condition is that Israel must dominate other nations. And you don't need to be a military expert to look at the political map and see that the Israeli army is the strongest in the region. It is a regional dominant power, uh, one of the strongest in the world, one of the largest arms exporters in the world. And so clearly, it would seem that that second condition has also been satisfied. And so if it would seem that we, by Maimonides standards, are in the Messianic era, then why 100 years ago, when the Zionist movement began in earnest and started bringing Jews to Palestine to colonize there, why at that time did most Orthodox Jews oppose it? Why 100 years ago, a century ago, did the vast majority of Orthodox Jews oppose the Zionist movement? And the reason why is because it was secular. It wasn't a religious movement. The Orthodox do want Israel to be a superpower, but they want it to on their terms. They want it to be a religious state, a theocracy. And the early Zionists, if anything, they were secular. Women served in the military. 
Women served in political capacity. This was former Prime Minister Golda Meir. And so this was unacceptable to Orthodox Jews because, again, going back to Maimonides, women may not be made officials, as it says, a king on you and not a queen. And so for all tasks, only men may be appointed. You know, he also says it's a disgrace for a woman to go outside. Don't permit her to go out to leave the house except one or two times a month as needed. So, you know, pretty garden variety misogynist. Uh, but, but in any case, these are the rules around, you know, medieval rules for how women should be treated. And so the new Zionist movement could not receive the support of ultra-Orthodox Jews and ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox Jews, and so most opposed. Now, today, some Orthodox Jews still oppose Zionism, but they're only a minority. You still see photographs today, occasionally of like at Palestine Solidarity protests, you will see men clearly wearing the hats, the coats, the uh, side locks, the beards, that are traditionally worn by ultra-Orthodox Jewish men, and you will see them holding Free Palestine signs. There are still some ultra-Orthodox Jews who oppose the political Zionist movement, but very few. Today, these are a scant minority. Uh, they, they're completely unrepresentative. And how did that happen? How did, uh, in 100 years, the vast majority of Orthodox Jews oppose Zionism, and a century later, the vast majority support it. What happened? Well, what happened was a theological innovation it was made by this man, Abraham Cook. And before I tell you about him, one more sip of water. Okay. Okay. So we're we're in the tail end of the presentation. Still a few more things to tell you, but we're we're getting close to the end there. Don't want to uh, leave you hanging, but a uh, couple more stories to tell. One of them is this man. How did we get to the point where today most orthodox Jews support Zionism? The Jewish state in Israel. And so this man Abraham Cook, he was the chief rabbi in Palestine a century ago. And his views on no, non-Jews were not any different from uh, the rest of the Orthodox camp. He said, the difference between the Israeli soul and the souls of all the various levels of non-Jews is greater and deeper than the difference between the spirit of a person and the spirit of a beast. So you non-Jewish people in the audience, you're so low, you're so vastly different from us Jews that the gulf between us is much greater than the difference between you humans and other non-human animals. Um, so it's, it's a major miracle that we can even communicate, you lower life forms. Uh, but I've decided to suffer your presence for a couple hours just to get through the lecture. Um, of course, I'm, it's you know, dark humor, but th this, this, is a, this is an actual quote. Every single thing I put up on the screen can be independently verified by yourself by when the video comes out, just screenshot it and type it into Google and find out if I'm not right. In any case, his views were not outstanding on race relations, let's just say, but where they stood out were in, again, the theological uh, arena in which he proposed something called the concept of Chamoro Shel Mashiach, the Messiah's donkey. This is what he said. He said that transformed into the shofar of Messiah, Hitler and their ilk are awakening redemption. What does he mean by this? What's he talking about? Okay. This, just as right now, um, those amongst you who are Christians or, or even secular celebrators of Christmas, you're maybe sending Christmas cards one, to your friends and family. So also on the Jewish New Year, we Jews do this too. We send greeting cards to each other. And this was a greeting card that was quite popular amongst Jews to send on Happy New Year uh, 100 years ago. And um, here it depicts the traditional Jewish understanding of the Messiah to come. Okay. Now, according to this formulation, the old man is the Messiah. 
He's riding on a white donkey, according to legend. That is how the Messiah will enter Jerusalem. And in front of the Messiah, leading the donkey, is an angel with a shofar, the ram's horn. It is like a clarion call, calling out, announcing the arrival of the Messiah. And so now, Rabbi Cook, the chief rabbi of, in the land of Israel, is saying, okay, you know that shofar? Transformed into the shofar, into the shofar of Messiah? That's Hitler. They are the ones that are awakening redemption. That anti-Semitism, those inquisitions, those pogroms, those murderous anti-Semitism, hatred of Jewish people, that is the clarion call announcing that the Messiah is coming. Okay, so the angel is Hitler, according to Rabbi Cook. The Messiah is the ultra-Orthodox camp, the elimination camp, okay? And they will come to power, how? On the backs of the secular Zionists, the domination camp. So, until that point, as I said, the vast majority of ultra-Orthodox Jews opposed Zionism, but he said, no, no, there's no need. True, we don't want a secular state, but all we need to do is wait for them to do all the grunt labor. Let them come. They'll clear the fields, they'll build the roads, they'll expel the Arabs, they'll create all the institutions of the state we want. And once they've done all the work, then we will ride in on the back of the donkey. We will inherit the country from them and then lead it. And from that point, we will turn it into a theocracy that we want. So once he crafted this theological loophole, then gradually he, you know, many Orthodox people were swept up into this theory. And began to support the Zionist project. Now, of course, the Zion this project was uh, pilloried by socialist Jews at the time, who in the, um, in the New York City newspaper, uh, the Goise Kundis, uh, they illustrated uh, that same vision of the Jewish Messiah, but instead of coming in on a donkey, coming in on a cannon, supported by militaries. And, you know, saying this is ridiculous. According to our tr Jewish tradition, he's supposed to come in on a donkey. Now you're saying that the Messi Messianic age will come thanks to militarism and nationalism? No, not for us. But, but, th but this idea took hold and became popular. And, and, and it paid off rather well because if we think about before the Holocaust, I mean, Jewish people had always uh, supported um, education in the community and it always sent some of its brightest minds to study at religious seminaries and so into at yeshivot but at any one time there were only ever four in all of europe there were only ever four thousand students or so at any one time studying in a yeshiva where they would just study torah and talmud all day and that was only temporary it was only for maybe three four years just like a you'd go to university do a bachelor degree and then go into the workforce that's what european jews did throughout their existence. They did support education, studying their own texts, but it was only for a few years and then they went into the workforce. But once we have the fusion of nationalism and religion, and we have not just orthodoxy, but we have state-sponsored orthodoxy, once they cut a deal with the founders of the state, now this has ballooned to the point where you have 160,000 people in Israel who do not work, who spend all day just, you know, arguing over the minutia of legal you know, loopholes in the Torah and the Talmud, and you know, are paid salaries by the state. Uh, and of course, that kind of political power that they wield, you know, what we've seen in recent years is now the polit, because of this sick fusion of nationalism and fundamentalist religion, we find that the views of Meir Kahana, the founding father of, Israel, of what he wants to become Israeli fascism. This, uh, this man has become a martyr in Israel, you know, uh, a visionary of sorts. And his ideas are, they're receiving a renaissance. And so now you have, if you can imagine this, chief rabbi of uh, Kiryat Arba, the Jewish settlement in Hebron, outside Hebron. So Dov Lior, He's a supporter of, you know, an acolyte of Meir Kahana, praises him and organizes memorial services to remember his heritage of hate. So Dov Lior 
founds groups to carry on the Kahanist legacy. And then who do you think supports Dovlio? He gets contributions from this man, David Friedman, the American ambassador to Israel, gives donations to Dovlio, this Kahanist creep. OK, so the American Jewish elimination camp is funding the Israeli eliminate, Jewish elimination camp. We see it so much so that when David Friedman is in, you know, he's in Israel, and he comes to visit a religious seminary, and they present him with a beautiful photograph as a present. And you can see, grinning from ear to ear, couldn't be happier. You look closer at the photo, you see, is that temple slash abattoir that the eliminationists want to build instead of Al-Aqsa. Instead of Al-Aqsa, he wants a temple. And he's grinning from ear to ear. This is what he wants. Now, the problem is they don't have quite enough power to accomplish it. Because after all, there are like a billion Muslims in the world who would be horrified by the state of affairs to destroy this ancient shrine. So they need allies. It's not enough for the Jewish eliminationist camp to coalesce. They need support from the Christian eliminationist camp. So who does the American government get to give a benediction at the opening of the new US embassy in Jerusalem? None other than this man, John Hagee, the head of the largest Zionist organization in America, the Christians United for Israel, five million members. They are the most powerful Zionist organization in America. And according to Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel's best friend. Now, David Friedman and the rest of the Jewish eliminationist camp, they think that what will result from this uh, pact, this blood pact they're signing with the Christian far right, they think that, OK, we'll get some diplomatic support from these Christian eliminationists. And their toil to provide us with support will allow us to ride in on their coattails. And with their support, we will be able to fully conquer the rest of the lands, including Al-Aqsa, and then we will reign supreme in this land. He thinks he's the Messiah, and Hagi is the donkey. But Hagi thinks the exact opposite. Hagi thinks that, OK, all right, I support Israel. I want all the Jews to move back to Israel, he says. Yeah, he wants that. He wants that because according to his religious theory, he want, in his end times fantasy, he wants all the Jews to move back to Israel and then for their all to be genocided. I mean, first of all, he also shares, you know, that belief that Hitler is what caused the state of Israel, that if it wasn't for Hitler, there'd be no, according to him, quote, God says the hunters shall hunt the Jews to get them to come back to the land of Israel. What Hitler did in the Holocaust, Hitler was a hunter. So he too, uh, thanks Hitler for his role in creating the state of Israel, just like the uh, Rabbi Cook. But like I said, his end times vision is for all the Jews to come back to Israel and then for there to be a crazy world war, apocalypse, and whichever Jew doesn't convert, in other words, 99.9% .9 of the Jews who don't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who just decide to stay Jews, all those 99% of the Jewish people will be genocided. Not just today, but for all eternity, forever. That's his love of Jews. These are Israel's best friends. This is insane. And it's not only there in the United States. You think they got problems? Right here in, Israel, in uh, the Netherlands. You know, um, I'm glad that y'all came out to hear me tonight. Some people find it difficult to hear some of these stories that I'm telling you, and so, um, one Zionist lobby group here in the Netherlands, you know, they also bring in speakers. So who did they bring in to counter my message? Two weeks ago, they brought in the Kufi representative, the Christian eliminationist representative. They brought over their black subsidiary, the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. They brought their representatives to come give a lecture here in Amsterdam, you know, to tell you people, no, what are you talking about? Israel isn't racist. Take it from a black. Christian Zionist, she'll tell you. Now, um, just a couple quick words about race and African peoples. Uh, it's 
way too much for me to get into right now. But it's a very important story that I reported a lot on, but there's no time. I, I won't do it justice. Just a couple quick words so you understand this, this little segment of the story as we approach the end of the lecture. And that is, it's not only Palestinian people that are, that are hounded in Israel. There are also 64,000 asylum, African asylum seekers, rather, African asylum seekers who entered Israel in the last decade. Uh, they make up less than 1% of the population of the country. But Israel has rejected 99 plus percent of the refugee requests, making it the lowest refugee acceptance rate in the world, shamefully. And because of this, their pol whole policy has been to make their lives miserable, to, dr to f immiserate them to the point where they give up and self-deport. And this policy has been so successful that the government has ethically cleansed the country of African refugees, half of the community in the last five years, since 2013. So now that 64,000 is now maybe 32,000. So again, without going into details about the community, but the point is that one of the ways that the government makes their lives miserable is, you know, I can just walk into a government office into the Misrata Pnim, the Interior Ministry, and get my documents renewed whenever I need to do so, if I do passport, you know, ID card, whatever. But not these black folks. They can't just go into a government office. No, 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 although you should be allowed to, but no. The government says, you can only go to this one little office in the middle of nowhere out there. It's not even an office. You have to stand in the sun, in the rain, in the cold, in the heat, in the parking lot. There's nowhere to, nothing to, you can't get something to eat or something to drink or go where to pee or hide from the sun. Nothing. You're just in the rain, in the, and, you know, families, mothers, children, it's a horror show, you know. And the reason why I tell you this whole story is because it happened in an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood, strangely enough. And when a couple of uh, ultra-Orthodox people saw this, they were moved by this, and they knew that they couldn't allow it to stand. And so this group of uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews, they actually organized, they built a shade structure. So at the very least, while they're waiting to days or you know to renew their papers, at least they're not in the hot sun. And in fact, they got these porta potties, outdoor toilets, so that at least they have a place to pee while they're waiting in line all day. So all this to say, don't assume just because someone looks ultra-Orthodox has the symbols or signs uh, of ultra-Orthodox that are associated with ultra-Orthodox Jews. There's all kinds of reasons why people wear the dress code and you know, align themselves with a specific racial or uh, religious sect, rather. You know, people derive community support from religious institutions. And so just because someone identifies with a specific sect, it doesn't mean that they necessarily abide or adhere to or you know, believe in all the tenets of that, of that sect. But so clearly, there are some ultra-Orthodox people who are not racist and who love their fellow man and see them as their equals, including these people. And this is the woman who organized that event. But having said that, notice that her face is blurred out at her insistence because although she did this, she suffers threats. In her words, she said, the number of curses I've received since we started this group, I, in my entire life, I never received even 1% of what I've been getting. That's the amount of abuse she gets from her, own from her own community for daring to just build a little shade structure on top of these African refugees. So. And she didn't go into any details. We don't know exactly what curses those were that she was receiving from her fellow ultra-Orthodox Jews, but we do have a good idea of the other curses that another group of Jews receive by extending solidarity with Africans. These are Holocaust survivors, Jews, European Jews, who survived the Holocaust here on the continent somehow, some way, after the Holocaust, made their way to then Palestine, now Israel, and have since lived the rest of their adult lives in Israel as citizens of the state. Now, some of these people were very moved by the plight of these African refugees. Their hearts went out and said, no, the government wants to expel them. We reject this. We will take them into our homes. We, ourselves, will provide them with refuge. And you know, it was a noble effort. I applaud them for doing so. But when the media, the Israeli media, reported on this effort by Holocaust survivors to take in refugees, these are just a sample of the kinds of messages that they received. 
the kinds of responses that Israelis wrote in their own names connected to their own social media accounts. They write, in the Holocaust, I bet their parents helped the Germans. Get the hell out along with them. We don't lack for Jew haters in this country. Too bad with them, Hitler didn't finish the job. I wish upon you an ocean of venereal diseases. May you experience rape and violent attacks. May an infiltrator split your body in half. I'd like to commit a holocaust on all the leftists. Drink your blood and fuck your women. I don't even know what I'm supposed to say at this point. It's too disgusting to even find words for. Now, again, I told you that story just to say, yes, there are ultra-Orthodox people who are far from racist and who are anti-racist, but they are a very small minority and they're beleaguered and despised in their own community. Now, we talked about Palestinians, we talked about African refugees. Would you believe it? There is another group of people that the ultra-Orthodox despise even more, or that the leaders of the ultra-Orthodox community hate even more. Could you wager a guess? Anyone want to like throw out an... any ideas? Yeah. Sorry? Women. Women. Okay, that's one suggestion. Any other? Homosexuals. Homosexuals. Any a third guess from the audience? Secular people, non-religious people. Okay, uh, all you know, decent attempts at an answer, but in fact, it's another group. And I'm going to give you some more hints. Maybe these additional hints will help. So it's not women, queer people, or uh, secular people. Here's some hints. This is Israel Eichler, uh, uh, a member of the Knesset for one of these ultra-Orthodox parties, eliminationist parties. And this is how he is in Knesset described these folks, this group. Jew haters, support anti-Semites in Europe. They are worse than the Arabs. They're mentally ill. They're heretics. They're assimilators. Any other guesses about what group of people I might be referring to? OK, there's a guess, self-hating Jews, so-called. Any other guesses? BDS supporters, so dissidents, people who disagree with the nature of the government and its policies. Any? Would you believe it? It's not that either. I'll just show you that it's a religious group, in fact, a religious minority in Israel. And here uh, is one of their places of worship that, as you can see, uh, you know, some eliminationist camp. Uh, folks went out and scrawled graffiti on their place of worship, on their house of worship. And they also left behind knives inscribed with verses from Maimonides, no less, in which he wrote, the laws of murderers, the heretics, they worship gods foreign to Israel. It is a commandment to kill them. And they even left placards with the names of those religious leaders that they call to kill. And I'm talking, ladies and gentlemen, about these religious leaders, this religious community, Reform Jews. So what is Reform Judaism? Just like in Christianity, there's all kinds of different, uh, you know, d different sects of Christianity, Catholicism, Protestantism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also in Judaism, there always have been different sects. And today, too, we have different sects, and this is one of them. And it actually has a history right here in Amsterdam. I don't know how many of you know this. You may or may not know. But this is, well, you surely know what Amsterdam might have looked like from your history books. But in Amsterdam, uh, a couple hundred years ago, at a time when the whole continent was going through like an enlightenment phase, and people were questioning their commitments to religion of their forefathers, and... In this synagogue here in Amsterdam, they kind of you know, stood, stood back and said, you know what, um, now I can be a citizen of the state and I can start to see Christians as fellow Dutchmen, just as I am you know, a Dutch person, they are a Dutch people, and I don't want 
bad things to happen to them. And maybe it's not so nice when every Saturday in synagogue we say this prayer that calls on God to like revel in their destruction. You know, He will execute judgment among the corpse-filled nations, crushing the rulers of the mighty land. It's, it's a bit insulting to non-Jews, and there's no need for it, really. You know? And so these, this synagogue here in Amsterdam said, okay, you know what? We're going to delete that prayer from the prayer book. We're no longer going to say that anymore because we think it's offensive. And so they did so. And that was really the beginning of the reform movement of Jewish folks coming from the, the Orthodox tradition, which was all that existed by that time because everything else had been crushed out. But them saying, no, we need to you know, keep the baby, but throw out the bathwater. There's bathwater there that could go. And so this is a, one of the leading... Uh, rabbis of the reform of the reform movement in its infancy and Abraham Geiger he said quote the Torah as well as the Talmud should be studied critically okay we don't have to accept every living every word there as like the living word of God no we can analyze the text we can debate the text and we can edit the text we are the masters of our own fate and so um, and so this is what they did but Again, how is that seen by the mainstream orthodoxy of the time? Well, again, go back to Maimonides. What do they have to say about people who do not accept the, the, the godly nature, the divine uh, nature of the Torah and the Talmud? Maimonides says, those who say the Torah is not divine, they're not even Jews, and he who kills one of them does a great deed. It is a commandment to kill them. If you have the power to kill them by the sword in public, do it. If not, you plot against them until their death comes about. So again, this is why they are so despised just for trying to come up with a version of Judaism that's anti-racist or less racist or not racist or stripped of its racist elements. And so again, uh, thankfully, I'm happy to say that the reform movement is, maybe was the first, but it isn't the last. Since then, we have other versions of Judaism, other sects, other schools. And uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, the conservative movement, the next largest religious movement after the reform movement, at least in the American context, uh, they too decided, you know what? You're right. There's racist elements in Judaism, and we need to eject them. And so he gathered together the conservative movement's greatest minds, the official ruling, you know, uh, ruling body of the conservative movement. He united these rabbis, and they unanimously voted to accept his proposal. And this is, was his proposal, quote. He said, there are passages that depict Gentiles as inferior to Jews, and sometimes even as less than human, as I've showed you plentifully up until now. Many of these can be explained as reactions to cruel treatment of Jews by non-Jews. Okay, you can kind of understand some of it. If someone has experienced so much anti-Semitism in their lives, it's easier to understand, not justify, but understand why they would, such a person could develop feelings, negative feelings for all non-Jewish people. Okay, but some, however, go far beyond that, he says. So, yes, we can understand why people who went through the Holocaust for example, or people who have family who went through the Holocaust or, you know, have such antagonism or develop antagonism and develop revenge fantasies even. The whole, you know, Quentin Tarantino, Inglorious Bastards, the idea of bashing Nazis over the head, uh, traveling back in time to do so. I mean, yeah, it's, I can easily understand why, you know, you would fantasize about doing that, but you don't then turn that fantasy into a re religious edict. You know, and so in, the, in Israel in the 1960s, there was actually like a whole series of semi-pornographic adventure novels that were essentially, you know, kind of um, sexualized Nazi revenge stories. That was, that was very, so I, I do get it, okay? Yes, you know, I also have imagined fighting back and killing anti But again, we don't generalize that to the 99.9% .9 of the world that is not Jewish. That is insane. And so the conservative movement, again, identifies that that sadly has been the case in Orthodox history, and we are now turning a new page. He says that we reject the ideas found in Jewish writings that consider Jews to be inherently superior to Gentiles. These concepts shouldn't be considered part 
of accepted Jewish belief. They have no right to be part of Judaism. It is forbidden to murder, rob, cheat, deceive, or otherwise harm a non-Jew. All rules discriminating against Gentiles are no longer authoritative. They are intrinsically immoral, he says. And the laws intended to keep Jews from contact with idolaters are no longer valid. So against the elimination credo, against the domination, against um, the segregation credo. So I'm very happy that the conservative movement had the courage to come out and explicitly state that they are rejecting those racist laws of the past. But at this point, you know, this idea of uh, that Judaism can be reformed isn't only dangerous to the Orthodox. It isn't only the purview of the eliminationist camp. At this point, even the, the, the domination camp is, despises the reformed Jews because they are suspect of not sufficiently despising the Arabs. Because they don't hate the Arabs and the non-Jews enough, we don't know if we can trust them. So this is Yariv Levine. He's Israel's tourism minister. His job is to bring people and Jews from all over the world to visit Israel. But what does he say about American Jews? Reformed Jews in the USA are a dying world. They will be irrelevant within two generations. He's pining for the time when there will be no more reformed Jews left. Of course, reformed Jews are actually the largest percentage of Jews in America that belong to any denomination. And Orthodox are actually only 10% of American Jewry. But he is putting all his money on orthodoxy, and he's counting the days until reformed Jews don't exist in his mind. Um, why? Why does he despise them so? Because, he goes on to say, miscegenation occurs there on a massive scale. I know not everyone in the room is going to even understand that word, and I guess that says something about this country, thankfully, but um, that miscegenation is a pseudoscientific word, which is like a, uh, you know, like a whitewashed way of saying race mixing, okay? Romantic relationships between uh, white folk and black folk or Jews and non-Jews, that's miscegenation. It occurs there on a massive scale in America. A so-called reform rabbi weds the daughter of Hillary Clinton and no one condemns it, thereby legitimizing it? Like, this is the enemy to him. Like, you know, the rest of the room, I assume, sees this as, oh, Romeo and Juliet, star-crossed lovers, you know, how sweet. Love conquers all, you know. But to the Israeli government, this is, you know, everything that they want to prevent. Racial purity. Now, if it was only the right wing, eh, nicha, okay. Could understand it. But even the so-called centrist wing of the domination camp, even Isaac Herzog, who is the leader of the Labour Party for the past five years until uh, Abigabai took it over, the leader of the opposition, so-called. On his last day as leader of the opposition, he says, it's an actual plague. I saw my friend's children married or coupled with non-Jewish partners. Listen, it's every Jewish family in the US, and we're talking about millions. There must be a campaign, a solution. We have to rack our brains to figure out how to solve this. Okay. Jewish people and non-Jewish people loving each other is a problem that he has taken it upon himself to solve. This is how sick it gets by the great white hope of the Labour Party. Bichyat. So, of course, it, it wasn't really any shocker for a student of history. That was the Isaac Herzog of today. His grandfather, Isaac Herzog, was the chief rabbi in Palestine in the 1930s and 40s. And at that time, he too was disgusted by miscegenation, what little it occurred. And uh, he wanted to you know, turn the time back to medieval era when rabbis would send out thugs to cut off the noses of Jewish women who were suspected of dating non-Jews. So he decides to create a committee to protect the dignity of Jewish women, or the purity of Jewish women, and they made lists of which Jewish women, in her words, Yudiot Nesuot La'aravim, Jewish women married to Arabs. They compiled files on them, and then commando groups would go out, hunt those women down, 
in their places of work, in their places of residence, whatever. And in, their, the, in the words of one of these men, describing what he did, upon catching, or sorry, upon catching one of those girls, they would flip her upside down and pour hot pepper into her vagina. Sexual torture for the crime of deciding for yourself what you're going to do with your genitals. No, they, they don't belong to you, ma'am. They belong to the nation. They belong to the God. You know, and of course, he goes on to explain, sometimes there were even more extreme actions than that. None of the people who committed these horrific crimes have ever stood on trial in Israel for what they have done. There has never been an inquiry even. And this was contemporaneous with the same thing happening in Nazi Germany, disgustingly enough. This is in the 30s, in the 40s. So, I mean, it's just beyond the pale. And today, is it any different? Well, I don't know of any women who are, you know, have to undergo that horrific uh, torture, but we still have anti-miscegenation groups that scour the country, that patrol Israeli cities and harass and harangue and attack mixed couples to try to prevent romantic relationships. And again, it's the Kahanist ideology that animates it. And now these anti-miscegenation groups, I mean, until a couple of years ago, they were actually on the government payroll. They were getting government funds to do these activities. Once uh, my colleague at Haaretz, Uri Blau, discovered this, reported on it, exposed it, it was a bit too embarrassing for the government. So since then, they haven't, to my knowledge, fi directly financed the group. But, you know, no big deal. Instead of Netanyahu himself funding Lehava, he just gets Nili Falik, who is his number one funder. The family that funds Netanyahu's election campaigns, his number one financier, so she became the largest financier of Lehava, the funder of that miscegenation. So Netanyahu's bag, bag woman is essentially now the new, has become the bag woman for Lehava, the funder of Lehava. Um, we're right at the end of the presentation. I'm not going to keep you here any longer, but I don't want to leave you in this, you know, at this really, really low point. I, it's true. We're in a very, 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 very horrific predicament. And these are the people who are, you know, claiming for themselves the mantle of the leadership of the Jewish community in Israel and outside of it. But thankfully, she's not the only one who's speaking out. There are other voices, like this man, a popular author, an American Jew, wrote the Yiddish Policeman's Union, excellent novel. And uh, he gave a speech this past year at the reform movement when it... Uh, when its graduating class of rabbis received their diplomas from their academy, they brought him in to give the graduation lecture. And what he said there was, were you to ask me if I hope my children marry fellow Jews, I would say, I want them to marry into the tribe that prizes learning, inquiry, skepticism, openness to new ideas the tribe that enshrines equality before the law and freedom of conscience and human rights, the tribe that sees nations and borders as antiquated canards, and ethnicity as a construct, prone as all constructs to endless reconfiguration. This is the world's most populous tribe. There will be plenty of potential partners for my children to choose among. And you know what? A fair number of those potential partners are even likely to be Jews. So I'm glad that there are other voices. But the last question we should ask ourselves before we leave is, what's the relative strength? How strong are these sentiments in Jewish society after everything I've told you tonight? And once again, we turn to a Pew poll. Thankfully, we can crunch the numbers. And a couple years ago, American Jews were asked, what is Judaism? What is your Judaism? What is Judaism to you in your life? Of course, many said, yes, observing Jewish law. That is my Judaism. 
others said, naturally, caring about Israel. That's, my, that's how I express my Judaism. Many more people said so. And yes, many people said that being part of a Jewish community, that's how I express my Judaism. But wouldn't you know it, the largest group of American Jews, the vast majority, not even close, said, what's Judaism to you? What is the most basic definition, the most basic expression of your Judaism? Working for justice and equality. 56% of American Jews said, working for justice and equality? That's my Judaism. That's how I'm a Jew, by doing so. Now, what does this tell us? What is the takeaway here? Well, what I take away from this is, yes, there are many ways of being a Jew, but with all of its problems, and we can talk for days on end about the problems in the United States of America, but for all its faults, at least there is a marketplace of religions. At least there's no state-sponsored religion. There's a separation of state and synagogue, or church, a separation of church and state. And without state-sponsored orthodoxy, we see that the Jewish people, left to their own devices, have diverse views, but the dominant view, the strongest, the most widely held principle amongst American Jews, left to their own devices, is working for justice and equality. This is what we could look like in Israel and anywhere else in the world if it wasn't for this fusion of nationalism and religion. And so the last word I'm going to leave you with. When you walk away from this presentation, if you remember nothing else, it is this basic schema, because we're not going to get any better unless we at least are operating with the same set of facts and we are looking without rose-colored glasses at the State of Israel. If you look through rose-colored glasses and you're like, oh, wow, Israel's so great, I love Israel, and Netanyahu is amazing, and everything he does is amazing, that is insane. Okay, if anything I've showed you in the last hour and a half is that it's far from reality as you can get. But it's almost equally distorted to say, oh, no, Netanyahu is evil, he's bad, he's the cause of all the problems. Oh, if only we voted for the alternative, if only we elected Avi Gabay, the head of the Labour Party, then all the problems will be solved. And that is equally ridiculous, as I believe I've demonstrated over the last 90 minutes. When you do that, when you reduce it to this binary dynamic, okay, what you've done is you've A, completely deleted the fact that a very large proportion of the Israeli body politic, an increasing one, is eliminationist. They don't just want what is right now. They want it to get worse, a lot worse. And again, when you break it down to that binary division, you obscure the fact that, in fact, these two contenders are, in fact, two factions of the same domination camp, the one apartheid state camp. And when you reduce it to that binary division, you also obscure the fact that the Israeli left, what we call the Zionist left, though it exists, it's a tiny fraction of the populace, only maybe 5%. And of course, you completely obscure the voices of the Palestinian people and their leadership, both Palestinians who have citizenship and, of course, those that don't, who put together, we're talking about 50 plus percent of the population. Don't cut out their voices. Let's start looking at reality only by looking directly at reality. Can we hope to chart a new course for the future? I hope I haven't depressed you too much. Thank you so much for listening for 90 minutes. Now we can talk soon. Thank you very much, David, um, for the meticulous research that um, preceded your lecture and also for this wonderful lecture. Um, I'm very tempted to start asking questions myself. For one, I learned a new word, 
Um, so I'm a biblical scholar, yet I had never heard uh, the word mm. monolatrism. Mm. Cool. So I'm, you know, I want to ask more, but I won't do that because I want to invite the panel uh, and the panel prepared questions to ask uh, to you. Um, so first, uh, Lauri Treffer. Oh, so I have to say also that this event uh, is sponsored by the Leonard Voltje Stichting, the Rights Forum, Kairos Sabil and Doc Pay, and each of those organizations sent, let's say, a representative uh, to ask you a question. So first, uh, there's Lauri Treffers, uh, who represents the Rights Forum. Uh, she's a freelance journalist and a conflict analyst, and she has an MA in Conflict Studies and Human Rights, and in her work she focuses on conflict, religion, and women in the Middle East and North Africa region. Welcome, Lauri. Thank you. Um, then I'm not sure if Dina Zbaidi is here because she may be ill. She's being by me. By you? Okay, because I thought that Fadi um, Hirzala was going to uh, replace, but then uh, Paul Arts, right? Um, can you please introduce yourself? Because I know you are... Uh, are you still a professor or you no, no longer? I, I, I'm, I even never was a professor. You never <laughs> see, well, in my eyes, uh, yeah. at least, no, you I were. I was teaching at the University of Amsterdam. <clears throat> um, and I'm the secretary of the Leonard Wolchow Foundation. Thank you. Um, and then I want to invite Martin Jan Heimmans, who represents uh, Doc P. Martin Jan is also here, yes. Um, he is a writer and journalist who has covered the Middle East uh, for a long time now, I think since 1977, uh, was part partially based in Cairo, uh, and you can also follow him on his blog, I'm sure many of you already do. The name of his blog is Abu Pes Optimist, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, right. that's it. Ah, okay. And then lastly, uh, another theologian, just like me, uh, Rien Wattel, uh, who represents Cairo Sabiu, the Netherlands. Um, I will just stand here in a little bit of a menacing way because I don't want uh, the whole question answer uh, thing take too long. Uh, yet I do want you to take time to, uh, to ask the questions that you have prepared. So, Laurie, can I ask you to um, yes. ask the first question? Um, so as Janneke just already said, my main interest is religion and conflict. Um, and actually, I've always been really interested in Islam. So thank you for uh, educating me more on Judaism. I thought it was really interesting. But what I didn't really get is you talk about the, uh, the uh, Judaist, Judaistic narrative. And um, <coughs> while most Israelis today are in fact secular, mm -hmm. and even uh, Netanyahu, he is secular. So my main question to you is, to what extent is this narrative the real narrative, and to what extent is it just used to conceal other motives? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, as I, as I showed at the beginning, the elimination camp, or the religious camp, is the second largest camp in the country. So truly, they are not, they do not have their hands on the steering wheel, but they're in the passenger seat, so they can lean over to the steering wheel and pull it on occasion out of the hands of the driver. The driver is the nationalist camp. So um, what that means is that over in the years, this, in the last decade, especially with the Orthodox ministers of education, that they have been ch changing the, the textbooks even, and initiating new programs in order to increase, uh, to religiousify uh, the youth. I'll give you just a couple of examples. So recently, textbooks have been rewritten, even like math textbooks. Instead of a kid's math textbook saying, oh, Johnny has three apples and Frank has four apples. How many apples? So it'll be instead, it'll be like, uh, there's three synagogues in the, this quarter of town, and you know the, each synagogue there's four prayers a day or three prayers a day. So how many prayers are there in total? So just where no connection to religion exists, the 
course book authors are being instructed by the Ministry of Education to embed these concepts into geography, economic, like every possible topic that has nothing to do with religion. That's one example. Another example off the top of my head, this uh, Templar movement that I described earlier, uh, it's not only that they exist in call for genocide and, you know, in, in their halls, it's that they are actually being paid by the Israeli government to instruct the youth to come into schools and to give students lectures and to incite in them uh, a desire for Templar activities, to learn about the temples of yore and the temples that could be in the future. So, of course, as I said, they can't control everything yet. And there is uh, pushback. I do admit that we see in recent months uh, Isra secular Israelis, uh, parents of children in the education system, are flabbergasted when they read these texts they notice these examples, and they're starting to band together and demand that, the, you know, that their children not have to uh, be subject to that kind of indoctrination. But still, because of the nature of the, our political system, those parties still wield a huge amount of power, and they have access to the public purse. So over time, it, even though they don't have full control yet, it's increasing, in my view. All right, thank you. Thank you. So uh, just to add to that, would you say that Lauri is right, that in fact uh, the Israeli government also needs this religious rhetoric mm. uh, also to cover up existing tensions uh, in society mm. so that, you know, it can't do away with it in any case? Mm. Well, I mean, I think that there needs to be a unifying ethos for, for the, you know, the nationalist camp to bring everyone together. Now, it just so happens that the ethos of you are the chosen people that's very useful mm. to indoctrinate a sense of you know unity amongst people we are all chosen we are all one and so latching on to that religious narrative is useful for the nationalist camp it works both ways like the messiah and the donkey uh have a, a symbiotic relationship with yeah. one another thank you yes. thank you Lauri. paul yeah thank you david um you made an enormous impression, but at the same time, you made me even more depressed than I was before coming to this event. As you already indicated at the end of your talk. Um, before I put my question, um, just to enlighten you, when it comes to the word of miscegenation, mm -hmm. there's at least one Dutch politician mm -hmm. who knows what the word means. Mm -hmm. And you don't know the person, but it's a Thierry Baudet. Homeopathische verdunning. It's more or less the same mm -hmm. as you indicated. Yeah. My question relates to, uh, it's more conceptual, mm. um, on the term theocracy. Mm. I think you rightly stated that Israel is not a theocracy yet, but it has certain uh, tendencies towards that. Now, my question would be what is your definition? of theocracy, what conditions have to be f fulfilled to make it a full-blown theocracy, uh, how far away are we from that, mm -hmm. and are we heading towards mm -hmm. uh, at a certain moment? So what should happen to get it realized? Obscure the fact that, in fact, these two contenders are, in fact, two factions of the same domination camp, the one apartheid state camp. And when you reduce it to that binary division, you also obscure the fact that the Israeli left, what we call the Zionist left, though it exists, it's a tiny fraction of the populace, only maybe 5%. And of course, you completely obscure the voices of the Palestinian people and their leadership, both Palestinians who have citizenship and, of course, those that don't, who put together, we're talking about 50 plus percent of the population. Don't cut out their voices. Let's start looking at reality only by looking directly at reality. Can we hope to chart a new course for the future? I hope I haven't depressed you too much. Thank you so much for listening for 90 minutes. Now we can talk soon.
Thank you very much, David, um, for the meticulous research that um, preceded your lecture and also for this wonderful lecture. Um, I'm very tempted to start asking questions myself. For one, I learned a new word. Um, so I'm a biblical scholar, yet I had never heard uh, the word mm. monolatrism. Mm. Cool. So I'm, you know, I want to ask more, but I won't do that because I want to invite the panel uh, and the panel prepared questions to ask uh, to you. Um, so first, uh, Lauri Treffer. Oh, so I have to say also that this event uh, is sponsored by the Leonard Volcher Stichting, the Rights Forum, Kairos Sabil, and Doc Pay. And each of those organizations sent, let's say, a representative uh, to ask you a question. So first, uh, there's Lauri Treffers, uh, who represents the Rights Forum. Uh, she's a freelance journalist and a conflict analyst. And she has an MA in Conflict Studies and Human Rights. And in her work, she focuses on conflict, religion, and women in the Middle East and North Africa region. Welcome, Lauri. Thank you. Um, then I'm not sure if Dina Zbaidi is here because she may be ill. She's being by me. By you? OK, because I thought that Fadi um, Hirzala was going to uh, replace, but then uh, Paul Arts, right? Um, can you please introduce yourself? Because I know you are. Uh, are you still a professor, or you? No, no longer. I, I I'm. Never, I even never was a professor. You never. <laughs> see, well, in my eyes, uh, yeah. at least, no, you I were. I was teaching at the University of Amsterdam, <clears throat> um, and I'm the secretary of the Leonard Wolchow Foundation. Thank you. Um, and then I want to invite Martin Jan Heimans, who represents uh, Doc P. Martin Jan is also here, yes. Um, he's a writer and journalist who has covered the Middle East uh, for a long time now, I think since 1977. Uh, was part partially based in Cairo. Uh, and you can also follow him on his blog. I'm sure many of you already do. The name of his blog is Abu Pes Optimist. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, right. that's it. Ah, okay. And then lastly, uh, another theologian, just like me, uh, Rien Wattel, uh, who represents Cairo Sabiu, the Netherlands. Um, I will just stand here in a little bit of a menacing way because I don't want uh, the whole question answer uh, thing take too long. Uh, yet I do want you to take time to, uh, to ask the questions that you have prepared. So, Laurie, can I ask you to um, yes. ask the first question? Um, so, as Janneke just already said, my main interest is religion and conflict. Um, and actually, I've always been really interested in Islam. So, thank you for uh, educating me more on Judaism. I thought it was really interesting. But what I didn't really get is you talk about the, uh, the uh, Judaism Judaistic narrative, mm. and um, <coughs> while most Israelis today are in fact secular, mm. and even uh, Netanyahu, he is secular. So my main question to you is, to what extent is this narrative the real narrative, and to what extent is it just used to conceal other motives? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, as I, as I showed at the beginning, the elimination camp, or the religious camp, is the second largest camp in the country. So truly, they are not, they do not have their hands on the steering wheel. But they're in the passenger seat, so they can lean over to the steering wheel and pull it on occasion out of the hands of the driver. The driver is the nationalist camp. So um, what that means is that over in the years, this, in the last decade, especially with the Orthodox Ministers of Education, that they have been ch changing the, the textbooks even and initiating new programs in order to increase, uh, to religiousify uh, the youth. I'll give you just a couple of examples. So recently, textbooks have been rewritten, even like math textbooks, instead of a uh, kids' math textbooks saying, oh, Johnny has three apples and Frank has four apples. How many apples? So it'll be instead, it'll be like, 
uh, there's three synagogues in the, this quarter of town, and you know, the, each synagogue, there's four prayers a day or three prayers a day. So how many prayers are there in total? So just where no connection to religion exists, the course book authors are being instructed by the Ministry of Education to embed these concepts into geography, economic, like every possible topic that has nothing to do with religion. That's one example. Another example off the top of my head, this uh, Templar movement that I described earlier, uh, it's not only that they exist in call for genocide and, you know, in, in their halls, it's that they are actually being paid by the Israeli government to instruct the youth to come into schools and to give students lectures and to incite in them uh, a desire for Templar activities, to learn about the temples of yore and the temples that could be in the future. So, of course, as I said, they can't control everything yet. And there is uh, pushback. I do admit that we see in recent months uh, Isra secular Israelis, uh, parents of children in the education system, are flabbergasted when they read these texts they notice these examples, and they're starting to band together and demand that, the, you know, that their children not have to uh, be subject to that kind of indoctrination. But still, because of the nature of the, our political system, those parties still wield a huge amount of power, and they have access to the public purse. So over time, it, even though they don't have full control yet, it's increasing, in my view. All right, thank you. Thank you. So uh, just to add to that, would you say that Lauri is right, that in fact uh, the Israeli government also needs this religious rhetoric mm. uh, also to cover up existing tensions uh, in society mm. so that you know, it can't do away with it in any case? Mm. Well, I mean, I think that there needs to be a unifying ethos for, for the, you know, the nationalist camp to bring everyone together. Now, it just so happens that the ethos of you are the chosen people that's very useful mm. to indoctrinate a sense of you know unity amongst people we are all chosen we are all one and so latching on to that religious narrative is useful for the nationalist camp it works both ways like the messiah and the donkey uh have a, a symbiotic relationship with yeah. one another thank you yes. thank you Lauri. paul yeah thank you david um you made an enormous impression, but at the same time, you made me even more depressed than I was before coming to this event. As you already indicated at the end of your talk. Um, before I put my question, um, just to enlighten you, when it comes to the word of miscegenation, mm -hmm. there's at least one Dutch politician mm -hmm. who knows what the word means. Mm -hmm. And you don't know the person, but it's a Thierry Baudet. Homeopathische verdunning. It's more or less the same, mm -hmm. as you indicated. My question relates to, uh, it's more conceptual, um, on the term theocracy. I think you rightly stated that Israel is not a theocracy yet, but it has certain uh, tendencies towards that. Now, my question would be, what is your definition of theocracy, what conditions have to be f fulfilled to make it a full-blown theocracy, uh, how far away are we from that, mm -hmm. and are we heading towards mm -hmm. uh, at a certain moment? So what should happen to get it realized? Um, in answer to your question, how far are we on the road to theocracy, you know, how quickly are we going down that trajectory? So this is Israel's Minister of Justice, Ayelet Shaked. You know, she has in the past made genocidal statements like this one, saying all Palestinian people have enemy, so they should all be killed, okay. Now, after she made the statement, she was made Justice Minister. Now, just this year, she passed a new law that states that from now on, Israeli judges, um, when they do not have a precedent setting, like if they have to make a ruling and they cannot find anything in Israeli case law that tells them, instructs them how they should 
rule in that instance that they should then turn to the Talmud as a guidebook. Okay, this law was passed just this year. So we can see that we are starting to take steps on that path. Now, this is the, in the current government, as we see each successive government becomes more racist than the one that preceded it. So for the next government, who knows, you know, the, obviously the cabinet seats will see a reshuffling. The woman who's already expressed her preference to be the next justice minister, and she may very well get it, this is from the ruling Likud party, <coughs> Nourit Koren, and she is now proposing uh, essentially that to strip the Supreme Court of its powers altogether. So if up until now there's been a check and balance system where the Israeli parliament can legislate laws, but if the judiciary finds that they are anti-democratic, then the judiciary can rule them, uh, overrule them and say they are unconstitutional, so-called. But according to the new law that Norit Koren is proposing, the judiciary would no longer have that ability. That the Knesset can vote in any law, no matter how racist, and that there would be, the Supreme Court would not be able to ra rail it in. Now, why I say this, because the law, as you see, she's standing on a podium, and this is the group where she's discussing that law, and this group is Der Chaim. They are a dominionist group, one of these groups that wants to turn Israel into a theocracy, openly. It's, a, it doesn't, it's not bashful about it. It says openly it wants to cr turn Israel into a theocracy, and she's partnering with them. In fact, they authored the legislation. They wrote the bill, and they convinced her to adopt it, and she's the one fighting for it in the Knesset, and she wants to be the next justice minister that strips the justice ministry of its power. So destroy it from within. Now, who is this man, Yitzchak Ginsburg, the chief rabbi of Der Chaim, this dominionist group that wants to turn Israel into a theocracy? Well, he is one of the most popular Chabad rabbis and most popular and powerful in Israel. He is the uh, religious authority behind the King's Torah. I don't know if you've heard of this book, The King's Torah, but it was published about a decade ago. It's like, a, again, a theological treatise. It asks the question, it says, under what circumstance may a Jew kill a non-Jew? That's the question the book asks. And it answers, the authors answer it by saying, well, pretty much under any circumstance, there is justification for killing babies if it is clear that they will grow up to harm us. Okay, you now have a license to murder babies. This man wrote the introduction to the book, the asmachta, the, the one who gave it the religious seal of approval. Yes, this conforms with all the laws of Judaism. I, <coughs> I sponsor this book. So he wrote this book, and after he wrote this book, people actually went out and burned a baby. They firebombed the Dawabsha family in the village of Duma in the West Bank, and him and his you know, one-year-old baby and father and mother were burned to death by people who took this book as an instruction manual. And at the scene of the crime, they scrawled graffiti with the Chabad uh, motto. Now, this man, as I said, you know, a couple years ago, he actually gave a talk at Tel Aviv Concert Hall, the largest public venue in Tel Aviv, sponsored by the Chabad movement. Okay, so this isn't fringe. And not only is it, you know, this is where the, the, the eliminationist camp, but as I've demonstrated, they are now being brought into the halls of power. It's the ruling Likud party that is co-sponsoring legislation with this group that openly advocates, uh, you know, a theocracy and even writes instruction manuals for how to commit genocide and he is now being whitewashed as a political partner of the Israeli government. So I know I didn't give you facts and figures to tell you how, you know, are we at a 23% theocracy or a 49%? I don't know the numbers, but I hope that these an anecdotes can relate in some small way the, the slippery slope that we're heading down, that we, we're approaching that 
that cutoff point every day. That's the most I can say about it right now, but it's frightening. And yes, there are people fighting back, but, uh, but this is the spirit of the times. This is the zeitgeist. A small follow-up. Very, very you didn't, small. You didn't yeah. give a definition of theocracy. And I mm. was wondering oh, okay. wh whether one could imagine different kinds of theocracies, mm. the mild version and the full version, for instance. Mm. Uh, do you really need a full-blown um, fusion of synagogue and state, mm. or could you also envisage some kind of a bit less, but still call it theocracy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but maybe this is too fundamental, conceptual no, to discuss you, now. I mean, you're right. I think that we'll never have, I mean, I doubt that we will ever have a pristine Theocracy. It never existed in this history because there was never a nation state until now. So even when Jews had sovereignty 2,000 years ago or had a Jewish kingdom, you didn't have the apparatus of the state that looked mm -hmm. into everyone's house and you know, could verify that you were following the rules. That's why there's temples of all gods and goddesses around Jerusalem contemporaneously. But, so it never existed in the past. Could it exist now? I think you're right. We can say there's a 30% theocracy, a 40% theocracy. I know that today, Jewish people and non-Jewish people cannot get married in Israel. They can get married outside the country and then move back into the country, and it's a fait accompli. This means that it, there's a tax on miscegenation. If you're rich enough, mm -hmm. you can get married to, to someone who's not Jewish. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's a you know, partial theocracy because that's a religious law. That, that's determining yeah. my, my status in life. Well, how would you uh, define theocracy? theocracy? <laughs> Um, I'm uh, um, very open to um, liberal interpretation of the words, of the concept theocracy. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, I'm dealing with Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and Iran, mm -hmm. and many people call Iran a theocracy. I don't agree. Mm -hmm. When you take the literal, rigid version of a theocracy, mm -hmm. but it has theocratic elements, mm -hmm. elements, like the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And the Taliban had an emirate which was called the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Islamic Emirate. So that, mm -hmm. that was maybe the purest form mm -hmm. in contemporary times mm -hmm. that we have witnessed. So you would also say that Israel now has uh, elements or characteristics of a theocracy or? Without any doubt, no. yes, of course, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Okay, we have to leave it at that, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, Martin Jan, the next question is for you. My compliments for your performance or your speech. Um, it's very, very difficult to ask questions because, uh, well, uh, it's very difficult to, to come in between. The, the first part, the, the, uh, the, the part of, uh, about the uh, political situation, I agree completely with. The, the other part is the part that the, the part about uh, theocracy or not and, 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 and uh, the influence of, of uh, religion is much more questionable because I always had this impression and still have the impression that uh, um, the, the, the most of the examples are, are really fringe examples. Mm -hmm. Even though they are very influential it is still a part of the settlement community. It's still part of the, of the religious community also. I got these two points, two things as, as associations when you were talking. One is that a good friend of mine who was a correspondent for the French uh, newspaper Liberation once had a, a car that didn't want to start. So he asked two soldiers that were nearby, can you help and push a bit? And they said, are you Jewish? He said, I don't know. He actually he had a, a Jewish grandfather, but he didn't say that. He said, well, it's a Citroën. Maybe it's a Jewish car. <laughs> didn't help. The other thing that came to my mind was... So what, what do we... What's the moral of the story? I want I'll to, tell you Oh, get, we still get there. Okay, <laughs> my apologies. Go on. Um, the other thing that came to my mind was that one of the most religious people in, in Israel was also the most outspoken critic of... Mm -hmm. The, the occupation of the West Bank mm -hmm. in 67. Even a few days after, after it was taken, mm -hmm. he, uh, he protested. Mm -hmm. He said, we have to give it back. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Yeshayahu Leibovitz. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It was a very admi admirable man. Mm -hmm. and so um, 
it's possible to, to make the choices. And still, I think that in Israel, even the religious people mm -hmm. have, to a large uh, part, a large part of them has this mm -hmm. opportunity to make the choices. But mm -hmm. maybe I'm wrong. You, you, you are going to tell me. But my question really is, mm -hmm. what was first? Mm -hmm. Was it nationalism? Was it xenophobia? Which xenophobia that is that is really a sort of uh, uh, a mark of, of the Jewish people through the ages, I think, or was it nationalism? Mm. Okay. And how do we fight it? Okay. <laughs> okay. Big okay. question. Can you nevertheless try to answer it brief? I'll, 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 I'll do, do that. that. It's impossible. impossible to answer, <laughs> but okay. Of course. <laughs> Well, um, just to, to try to relate to a few of the things that you've mentioned. You mentioned uh, Yeshayahu Leibovitz, who, who was definitely considered one of the greatest minds and hearts of the Israeli people. Like you mentioned, he vociferously opposed the occupation of 1967 and um, was a very vocal critic of militarism in Israel. Um, and in mm -hmm. fact... Judeo Nazis, so, yeah? He did. He did say that. I, I wasn't going to go there today, but 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 yes, he he did, and um, that shows that there is within the Orthodox tradition a stream that is humanistic, and it, in fact, decades ago, um, some of the strongest support for social programs in Israel, some of the weakest populations in Israel, did come from the Orthodox parties. So historically going back, um, disabled people who don't, aren't getting sufficient government pensions, it was actually these parties who promoted disabled people's rights. But today, because of changes that have gone through the Orthodox community in Israel, they've ideologically on other issues uh, completely, the axis has reversed. So today, those parties are the most vociferously anti-social programs, whenever a dis disadvantaged group stands up and says, we are being treated unfairly, like disabled people, like women, like queer people, but, but even if there, if there isn't a religious obligation, like there's nothing that says, you know, don't treat disabled people badly, but when disabled people ask for increased government pensions, saying, we don't even have enough money to pay for basics, we are getting, you know, welfare funds that are less than minimum wage, how can we even survive on these you know, tiny pensions, and, and you know, the, the orthodox press is like, fend for yourself, what do you think this is? And now, that's, decades ago, that's ludicrous. No orthodox person, or few orthodox people would have said that, but the leaders of the camp over the decades have shifted from one pole to the other, where they've become, instead of religious socialist in orientation, they've become uh, religious capitalist in orientation with everything that means. Mm -hmm. uh, hacking and slashing welfare programs. So I mean to say by this that the great man you mentioned was a shining star of a time when it was possible to be orthodox and be universalist, where you could still be an orthodox Jew and be a humanist. Sadly, that, his, his, that strand of Judaism has basically been snuffed out in recent decades. Um, uh, what what came first, the chicken or the egg? Right. Um, I don't know if I'm qualified. I, I think that I don't know enough about Jewish history, and there's so much Jewish history, and there's so many different places, and every community was different. You take a Russian Jew and an Ethiopian Jew, they look nothing alike. Their versions of Judaism were completely different. I don't even know a scintilla of the histories to, to be able to speak. It's a very interesting question, though. Yes, yeah, so we should organize mm. another lecture about that <laughs> question, I suggest, because we're not going Fair to enough. solve it tonight. Fair Sorry, enough. but I have no, to, we have fine. to stop here. Oh, legit. Um, Rin, your last, yeah. please. Uh, thank you for uh, ma making such clear lines in the uh, reshuffling the Israeli politics. Mm. So uh, we saw a big deal of the parties is uh, oriented on, on uh, domination and mm. elimination. Um, but I think going on on that way, uh, there will be a more and more stronger uh, need to suppress the, the minor part of Palestinians who are living uh, in West Bank or in uh, Israel or in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So um, do the uh, Israeli people 
feel that as a problem that that the, the, the way they're going now mm. is asking more and more suppression and also reaction, uh, terrorism, uh, bo bomb attacks and so on. Um, you, can, you can say if you look into other countries where it happened the same, uh, that will never end. Do the, maybe they hope it, it, it ends, but mm. yeah, does that feeling, does that image live in the uh, Israeli society? So you, if I understand your question, you're asking, do, uh, what role does the Palestinian play in the Israeli imagination? Do they want to continue this, or do they see an end game, or is that? Yeah, yeah, is, and, and is, there, is there an end game at all? If you, mm -hmm. if you yeah, maybe elimination is, is the end mm -hmm. game, but you can, you can suppose that that will, uh, will not be happened very soon, so mm -hmm. you, if you go that, that way, you always will have reactions, and uh, unsafe situations for yourself. So, do people feel that? Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, th this is what I'm arguing with the four side scenario that that these are the end games. That the domination camp wants apartheid forever. They're not advocating ethnic cleansing. They're saying we don't mind Arabs living around us. Who's you know we need people to do construction work. You know, and for the labor Zionists, we need to be able to claim that we are a democracy, so we need some minorities around. Um, but uh, mainly we need people to sweep streets and such and do grunt labor. And, uh, and so, yeah, the most parties don't, aren't, don't believe that Palestinians should be ethnically cleansed. They just want them to remain as second class. <laughs> it is the elimination camp that wants to ethnically cleanse them and they are 20% of the population. Um, I, I think that uh, in their minds, leaders of the elimination camp do not see themselves as warmongers. They actually would say that they want peace to reign in Israel. They just believe that peace can only begin once the country has been purified and theology has been instituted, the theocracy rather has been instituted, and then Peace will reign over the whole planet, in fact, once Jews are given their due and allowed to rule unquestioned with any other non-Jews, you know, crawling around their legs mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, so they see themselves as aspiring towards peace in, in their minds. And in fact, it's the domination camp that says, as Netanyahu said a couple years ago, we will live forever by the sword. Mm -hmm. So if there was ever an ethos in Israel saying, we fought, we, we killed, we were shot, we suffered casualties, but now one day, one day, our children will never have to fight. We fought so they won't have to, you know. Um, that was the ethos as long as the Labour Party was in power, more or less. But today, Netanyahu says, no, we will live forever by the sword. This reality is a permanent one. Get used to it. We will forever have to be tough and dominate because that's what you do when you don't want other people who demand equality to sit at the table with you. Mm -hmm. You must crush them. So I don't think that elimination is popular enough yet to sweep up the country mm -hmm. into a purge. Uh, I think that the 60% or so of Israelis want the status quo to continue. Mm -hmm. It costs them nothing. <coughs> or not nothing, I mean, but it's the least costing. Terrorism, uh, from, from it does. If, if they, you say they're second class citizens, yes. so they will ask for more and start all the time start move, movements for more rights mm. uh, you can you can expect but they, they yeah. accept that um, as a it, risk some people believe that you know look if you actually know people <laughs> Palestinian people then you can communicate with them and you know but n not everyone does that especially after they built the wall the apartheid wall separating Israel from the West Bank there's so few opportunities for Israelis and Palestinians to meet one another. If beforehand it wasn't uncommon for people to say, oh, let's go to Gaza and go to a fish restaurant for dinner, or oh, I need to get my teeth fixed, let's go to Tul Karim. Now that doesn't happen anymore, so mm -hmm. people don't even have that ability to know what's in the mind and heart of a Palestinian person. Um, and and uh, you know, the media messages they get all the time are reinforcing, they're all evil, they all hate us, they're all savages, blah, 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 blah. blah. So, um, I, 
you know, the, the, it's people can lull themselves into believing what they want, and and that's, of course, I see it as unsustainable, <laughs> but. Some Israelis will say, well, the Israeli mind will just come up with another new weapon to better quash yeah, yeah, yeah. the resistance. And in fact, European governments are buying those weapons. You know, right now, Europe is talking about purchasing weapons from Israel to better disperse refugees at its borders. Let's take Israel's example of how to kick out 99 plus percent of the African refugees and adopt it as, as our model. So um, unfortunately, these dastardly uh, ideologies are being exported to this part of the world. OK, and thank you, David, for that answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at the audience briefly. It's, uh, almost, it's a quarter to 10. How are you feeling? Shall we take two questions from the audience and then go to the bar? Or asking it like this, it's almost, uh, yeah. The, let, are there two questions? The lady here in front, and then there's someone there in the back. Is there a microphone, maybe? <laughs> It will be on record. Thank you. And, and can you please ask a brief uh, question? Sorry to. Um, okay. You have a double nation. You have a double uh, nationality. Mm -hmm. Okay. You are Israeli and Canadian. Correct. My uh, question is why. <clears throat> Why are you still um, uh, Israeli? Because mm. when I hear your lecture, uh -huh. um, it's really a terrible uh, country, and yeah. with, uh, mm -hmm. most of people uh, want uh, other people to go out yeah, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it is a terrible country. And why why don't you choose to to mm. go to Canada mm -hmm. and leave Israel uh, Israel? Uh, because mm. uh, yeah. There's no uh, reason to stay there, I think. Okay. Thank you. I'll collect one other question, sure. and then sure. you can ask. Sure, I, I just, I was wondering. <laughs> you did? No, no, no. See, Sorry. I, I can't imagine that you're a very popular guy with the parties that you described in Israel. Uh -huh. And so I was wondering if you ever, if you get death threats and whether it's difficult for you to do this job. I, I, this is a very friendly arena. I think everyone in this room sort of agrees. Um, yeah. Okay. Does that make your life or your work difficult? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you both for your questions. I'll answer them in reverse order. So it's very difficult to do this work. Um, death threats, threats of violence, it occurs. It doesn't occur often because today most of my work is done behind a desk. I do go into the field and when I do I'm scared because it's not uncommon for people to just feel that anyone documenting their behavior at a right-wing rally is a traitor and therefore deserving of attack. So I have been attacked physically uh, while filming. And I've, of course, received emails, tweets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but most of the time, it's, I'm not on people's radar in that sense. And the reason why is because most Israelis read their news in Hebrew, but I report in English. So most Israelis have no idea who I am. So I'm not like public enemy number one or something. Um, so I, I generally don't feel physically threatened. But the way that this work is especially challenging, I mean, besides de being depressing, but is that there's, it's not economically sustainable because as I've shown you those three camps, the, well, clearly if it's not already obvious, like my preferred solution would be one in which there are no borders or boundaries and one in which everyone is equal, right? The integration camp. But there's no integration camp newspaper. There's the Israeli uh, newspaper spectrum very much mirrors the political spectrum. So most of the newspapers, the ones with the largest circulation, are domination newspapers. Then there's elimination newspapers. And there's one segregation newspaper, two-state solution, Haaretz. You all know Haaretz, right? So just like 5% of the population supports the two-state solution, so 5% of the population approximately reads Haaretz. But there is no integration media in Israel not in print and not on the internet. So not how, in how Hebrew, can we not in support English. your work? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> make it rain. Um, of course, 
you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult and I'm working on this very hard with other journalists. Yes, I have PayPal. Yes, I have Patreon. And we're hoping to scale up the work that we're doing, me and my colleagues. So if you have the capability, yes, it's very much encouraged to, to show me a little love in, in, in a financial sense, but also to share the work that I do, to get past the uh, guardians of the mainstream media who are not comfortable with these stories coming out for political reasons. So um, you can augment our voices by sharing this work in social media. Um, but yeah, we do need a more concrete solution. We need to establish a new media outlet that lets us tell these stories without being dependent upon. Um, so the, 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 there's much more we can say, but there's time for drinks. The last question about, or the first question rather, about why, if things are so bleak, why do you still stay there? You have another passport. You could conceivably move back to Canada and and not have to live. And, and in fact, uh, while being far from perfect, race relations in Canada are, you know, he leaps and bounds better than they are in Israel. So um, the re there's, a, there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, first of all, I, I see, are, are you currently living here in this country full time yourself? Yeah, okay, so, so you're, you're okay with European winters, I'm not. <laughs> I can't wait to get back home. This is way too cold for me. I mean, I'm willing to suffer for a few days, but it's not how I want to live my life. Um, so I, I'm half joking, I'm half serious. I, that's the climate I want to live in. It's a beautiful land, it's a beautiful place. That's where my, you know, most of my cousins and uncles and aunts live. My family has lived there for 100 years. It's beautiful. Uh, I love the food, it's fresh. Uh, so many of my friends are there because as goddamn evil as you know, racist people are, the anti-racist ones are such beautiful souls that they you know, fill my heart and make me feel supported and loved, and that gives me the strength to get up in the morning and keep fighting, because fuck the racists, why should they decide? You know, I'm, yeah, it's convenient to live in a place where you have all the rights and where everyone else has all the rights and you don't have to fight, like here in Amsterdam where everything is so awesome, of course there's problems, I don't mean to whitewash them, but, but, but um, you know, at least I don't have to wonder, oh, what am I gonna do this morning, why even get up, boring. I, every day I don't have to, you know, I can fall asleep at night knowing that I did my damnedest and you know, knowing that there's something to do and uh, it's not easy, um, but, but there's so much potential there. God damn it. Like it's, you really, it, there are good things that the Jewish people have brought gifts to the land. You know, the fact that there are Jewish people from all over the world and mixing of all these international cultures in the place. Of course, if those, if the soil was tilled with that and, and, and these people were integrated with the Palestinians who were already there, then it could be even more multicultural and it could be like flourishing and like everyone would, you know, all, right at the axis of Africa, Europe, Asia, right in the center of it all, we could have, I don't even, you know, I don't know what to call it, but it could be the, the New York of the 21st century. It could be much better than New York. It could be paradise on earth if we get past this idiotic nationalist, you know, rat race or, or, or um, cycle of violence that we're into and just, and just get past that. So is it possible? I see it in my lifetime. I'm not patient enough to wait for my grandparents. I want it now, I want it in my lifetime. Um, so it's a cha it's, I have to ask that question of myself every day. You know, will I stay or will I go? Thank but you, audience. Um, I want to thank uh, the panel. I've, I know that you have much more uh, accumulated wisdom than we could do justice to uh, in this very limited amount of time. But thank you, Paul, Martin, Jan, Lauri, and Rien. Uh, for your questions. And most of all, David, uh, thank you for your courage and your perseverance uh, that you have shown tonight and that you've shown your work. And I hope we can um, support you mm -hmm. to continue this. Thank you very much. Thank you. And of course, thanks to all the organizations for uh, sponsoring this event. Mm -hmm.